morning. Bonjour. Bienvenue. I am Lisa Kahn, your host and co-chair of the French Heritage Society Chicago chapter. And I'm thrilled that all of you have come together today. And through our shared values of French heritage, we are united. As you might have noticed from the list of FHS's 2020 grant recipients included in your handouts, um, Prairie de Rocher, or Prairie de Rocher, um, I try to speak local uh, when, I, when I'm here, uh, and Fortnachat, which just marked its tricentennial anniversary um, of its existence, is near and dear to FHS's heart. 15 restoration grants were awarded by FHS in France and the United States this past year, totaling $160,000. Not so bad during a, a, a pandemic. In partnership with the Kemper Foundation, the Chicago chapter's grant support for Fort de Chart helped diffuse the unanticipated loss of support due to such extraordinarily challenging times posed by COVID-19. Next year marks the 300th birthday of Clary de Olche. I can't think of a more pressing and compelling reason to gather and commit to lending our support. In addition to preserving French heritage throughout France, and the Midwest by raising funds for restoration, preservation, and, and cultural grants, FHS Chicago is committed to transmitting and safeguarding the skills, knowledge, and love of heritage through Midwest-focused educational programs, internships, and opportunities for students, architects, historians, and other professional uh, artisans, art connoisseurs, and collectors. Through cross-cultural exchange, such as tours throughout the Midwest, lectures, conferences, and other fun gatherings, the French Heritage Society aims to foster Franco-American ties of friendship, l'amitié. As I personally visit and better get to know what was once known as the Illinois country. I have developed a deep appreciation for the historic and cultural treasures of French heritage found throughout the Midwest and their fragility. It has only been through my involvement with the French Heritage Society that I was even made aware of the existence of Fort de Chat and Prairie de Rose, and of the significant cultural and historic intersections with other groups within the greater historical context of North America. What is wrong with this picture? Why should such an important resource remain virtually unknown to people? It absolutely should not remain in the shadows of history. This morning, we will learn about the efforts to designate Prairie de Rose a national park and about the plan to promote and protect Prairie de Rose's cultural heritage. We will also learn about how old and failing infrastructure in Randolph County, Illinois, poses imminent threats to these treasured communities and about how the Prairie du Rocher Levy District's vision plans to address these challenges and opportunities with their strategic plan. We are grateful to Lisa's Market Street Grill for providing us our meetings venue and to all of you joining here in this room and virtually today. We have three speakers presenting this morning, followed by some time for Q&A. Then we will break for lunch in the beer garden until 1.30, when we will resume our conference with dynamic conversation on the subject of creating a French heritage corridor in the Midwest 
And let's welcome today's first speaker, presenting virtually on behalf of Illinois Sen Senator Tammy Duckworth, Jim Kirkpatrick. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I first became aware of the efforts to uh, get national park status uh, for the uh, uh, Prairie de Rocher uh, French Colonial Historical Society probably about a half a year or a year and a half ago. And it's something I picked up on immediately. Being from Southern Illinois, I've always been fascinated uh, about the story of Fort Deschard and Fort Kaskaskia and, and all the individuals that lived in the area uh, back in the late 1600s and 1700s. Um, I, uh, we put together an organizational meeting on uh, March the 6th, 2020. It was just a week before the pandemic started and uh, everything started shutting down and we had that meeting at the Randolph County Courthouse in Chester. And there were several people that were there today uh, at that time uh, that are on this call today. And I would like them to have an opportunity to say a few words after I finish, if that's okay. Um, you know, um, this is uh, such an important part of our history. And uh, when you look back at that time frame, it's, it's amazing uh, the involvement of the French in the uh, Mississippi Valley. And uh, uh, we had Senator Duckworth uh, on a meeting with the committee uh, back in early December of last year via Zoom. And uh, uh, Senator Duckworth uh, was impressed by what she heard. And I, I'm proud to report, and I know many of the committee members know this, but just a few weeks ago, Senator Duckworth met with the new Interior Secretary, uh, Deb Holland and voiced her support for this project to the new interior secretary. So I know that they're looking into this and hopefully uh, we will at some point in time know the progression of what's going to happen. I know they're doing a recognizance study. And uh, again, Secretary Holland indicated she would take a real good look at that. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, the committee for all the work that they've done on this project. Um, that includes the Kaskaskia Cahokia Trail Commission. And I'd also like to recognize, uh, as you read uh, about the history of this area, people that have really played an important role in, in recording this history. Uh, Dr. Margaret Brown, I, you know, every time I read something, it's amazing how much work she's done. And Emily Lines, and I'm, I'm sure there are others. And I'm also proud of the fact of the number of friendships that I've developed uh, during the time we've been working on this project. And that includes Chris Martin, uh, Raymond Cole, former mayor of Prairie de Rocher. Jennifer Dunsing, Dr. Mark Kena, Ed Weilbacher, and others. And also I would like to uh, uh, give a big thank you to Tim Good uh, with the National Park Service for all the help he's given us and the direction that we've taken to go on that. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, and I, I say this often, uh, Prairie de Rocher is as important to this area and the French colonial district is as Jamestown to the United States. If you look at the East Coast and the settlements, Jamestown's very important, but uh, the French colonial district in Randolph County is also very important. I've uh, had the opportunity over the last 
few months to read a few books. And if anybody uh, has an opportunity, I would encourage them to um, uh, take a look at these books. Uh, this is uh, Kaskaskia, The Lost Capital of Illinois. Uh, it was authored by David McDonnell and uh, Rainy Waters. And uh, it gives an early uh, depiction of uh, early French uh, history. And the other one, which I just finished, is uh, Lives of Fort Duchard, uh, Commandants, Soldiers, Civilians in French Illinois, 1720 to 1770. It's kind of hard to uh, amaze, but during the time that Fort Duchard was active, there were 14 French Commandants that served uh, Fort Duchard. And all of them basically, I think, were from France and they came to uh, this area by way of uh, New Orleans. And it's a very interesting history. It needs to be preserved. And I had a few other people on the call and I just like to recognize them. I know I saw Senator Terry Bryant uh, represents that area. See if she could say a few words, uh, Bill Furry. Yeah, we also have Lauren Bonner uh, with uh, uh, Senator Durbin's office. And uh, then uh, Katie Foley, or Katie Keller, who is, uh, she since married, uh, who is uh, my co-partner uh, with uh, Senator Duckworth's office. So I know uh, Senator Bryant's probably got a pretty tight schedule so uh, I'd like to turn it over to her and, and then everybody else can have an opportunity to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Jim, and, and thanks, uh, thanks everyone. Can you, can you hear me okay? Great, okay, okay. Uh, thank you for letting me join you today. Um, we are in session uh, today, so expect to uh, have to take a few votes here in a few hours or I'd love to stay with you all day. What I did want to say to you is um, I uh, am a native uh, of Illinois. I actually grew up in the Cahokia area uh, and then was transplanted a little bit later to a different part of Illinois, which also includes the Mississippi Valley. I represent the 58th Senate District in Illinois, which has the longest, um, the longest line of Mississippi shoreline in the state. So obviously anything that's along the Mississippi River is very important to me as a senator. But on a very personal note, I want to share a little bit about this region with you because I think it's important to know how important the history of this area is. And firstly to say remember that when you come to Fort de Charter and when you come to Prairie de Rocher, you're actually coming to what at one time was the end of the world as far as uh, people who were living during that time uh, considered. So they were coming to the last of what was, uh, I guess, the safe place to be. Um, the state of Missouri has acknowledged that through creating the arch. I think Illinois is a little bit slow about, uh, about acknowledging some of the history that's there. So again, remember that Illinois also settled from south to north. So the richest history that we have in Illinois, but also I believe in the Midwest comes from Southern Illinois, especially including the Randolph County uh, area. And so you cannot talk about Illinois history. You cannot talk about the history of the United States without talking about the history of the French, in particular, uh, the influence that the French had uh, in the Southern Illinois area. So I'm excited for the possibilities here I'm excited for uh, the opportunity for not just tourism for Illinois, but for tourism for the entire country and internationally. Um, also just wanna remind you that uh, as far as Native Americans go, Illinois actually had more tribes represented uh, here in Illinois and in particular in Southern Illinois than all the rest of the United States combined. And that's partly because of the Algonquin tribes uh, that uh, had a confederacy of tribes located in deep southern Illinois. So um, we all know the history of the French and the Native American tribes and how closely they were related, how interconnected their history is 
And so from an Illinois standpoint, but also from a national standpoint and international standpoint, this is a very important endeavor. And I hope that we'll get support at all levels. Um, you certainly have my support at the state level uh, as a, again, as a Senator, but also as a, really as a, a deeply invested um, member of this community and a lifelong, uh, tr uh, I don't, tr truly a, a fan of, of all of our history here. So I could go on for hours as most politicians do, but I won't. So thank you for the time today to, to talk about all of this. Thank you. Karen. Lauren, would you like to say a few words on behalf of Senator Durbin? Thank you, Jim, I will. Um, just wanted to say a big welcome to everyone who's here today and thank you and all of you with the French Heritage Society and those of you um, in Randolph County for spearheading this effort. Um, I, this, is, um, this is a bipartisan, wholehearted effort on, on behalf of you know, these senators, whether they're in the state or um, at the federal level. And I know Senator Durbin is enthused about um, you know, vocalizing his support for it in Washington. Um, and we're just glad to be a part of it and glad to um, you know, be along for the ride and, and help you guys in any way we, we can. And um, thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Lord. I just noticed that Matt Moberly is on the call from uh, Congressman Mike Boss office. I know Mike had been involved in uh, trying to get National Park Service uh, status for the area. Matt, would you like to say something on behalf of uh, Congressman Boss? Yeah, Jim, thanks a lot. Um, and everybody, thank you for, for having us and um, for holding this event. We, you know, Mike is very uh, interested and engaged with this. Um, he spoke with the last administration and presented some letters and you know, tried to get the, the reconnaissance study done. Um, and so we're glad to see that there's been progress on that. And, and him and the office have been in touch with uh, the current administration. So uh, we're very hopeful that as, as the reconnaissance study gets done, we can move forward and, um, you know, like the Senator said, do, do a lot of good work for the economy and for um, the region and all of its history. So thanks again. Thank you. Uh, from uh, Senator Duckworth's office. Would you like to say a few words? Yeah, I just want to thank you guys for um, having this meeting and all of your interest in this project. Um, I'm also a Southern Illinois native and am just so excited to get this conversation moving forward and to have this designation hopefully come down to Southern Illinois. I think it would be wonderful for our tourism and just really, I think Southern Illinois is such a unique place in our country. And I think it would really shine um, and illustrate how important this area has been for just our national history. So um, please let Jim and I know if you have any other questions or follow up and just happy to be here with you guys this morning. Thanks. Thank you. Also like to recognize Bill Furry. I've, I've dealt with Bill on a few other uh, historical projects. Uh, uh, Bill is with the Illinois Historical Society. Bill? Bill, I think we need to unmute you. There I am. I think I'm unmuted now. We'll see if that works. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to share our headquarters in Springfield with the French Colonial Archaeological Society. So we have a very deep interest in the region, uh, not just the Mississippi Corridor, but the Illinois River Corridor as well. Um, and uh, I am really excited to, to be with an organization that has a 300-year plan. I don't see many of those out there. So congratulations to you for having that uh, forethought that certainly predates that 300-year mark. Uh, outlast the, the Illinois Bicentennial. Uh, so I look forward to see what your planning for the next 300 years will be. So thanks much for the invitation. Is there anybody else uh, that I'm missing? I'll turn it back over to you then. 
So thank you very much for your remarks and uh, for all of you lawmakers and people um, who really appreciate history and the importance of preserving this, this writer. Um, thank you very much for your active interest. And I hope you will all stay with us uh, for the next few presentations and then for our Q&A. That will be uh, a very important and um, uh, interactive uh, chance for all of us to participate, share our ideas, ask questions, and get some answers so that we can all start to become on the same page, working together to uh, achieve our goals and our dreams. So I am now going to uh, turn it over to our next speaker, Jennifer Dunsing. She is the president of Les Amis du Fort de Chat. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm here also with our public relations coordinator and my, uh, I have to say my right hand, Carol, if anything out there looks wonderful that I wrote, she really wrote it and I wrote her name. So she is invaluable. Um, I also want to thank everyone for being here today. Um, we're from a small community. Most of us are volunteers. When you walk into any one of our committee meetings, you're going to see the same five or six people in all of those meetings. So to see the support that we have in this room today, here virtually and in person, it's phenomenal. And we just couldn't ask for a better response for what we all work so hard to try to achieve for our community. Um, I think it was about two years ago, Carol and I hopped in the car and went up and met the French consulate. Um, and he showed an immense amount of support for our area and our project, introduced us to the French Historical Society. We quick became great friends with them and said, any way that you can help us would be wonderful. And their response has been phenomenal. And we cannot appreciate what you do for us enough. Um, as I tell Lisa all the time, we have big hearts and we have passion about what we do, but we are small. So this is the relationships that we need to reach the people and to get the, the things done that we need to get done. So thank you again for everything that you do. Um, so as, as um, Jim, Jim and Lisa both mentioned, of uh, where's the support group for Fort de Sharp? So Fort de Sharp has an invaluable amount of visitors, um, a rep national, international reputation. Um, so as a support group for that, we look at what can we help do to develop the community, to kind of um, make more of the community an educational center, more um, to use our heritage to promote our future. Um, the ideas that we have um, are not new ideas. Almost 40 years ago, uh, people in the community got together and built the village hall, which looks like a French building. Those are the type of things that we are trying to keep going in the community. So when people come to a 300-year-old French town, they will see a 300-year-old French town. Um, so I'd like to introduce a project that we developed, um, taking all of these different pieces of previous projects um, and working to develop them further. And it's called the Heart of Illinois Country uh, Heritage Project. Um, it began in 2018. It's been our goal to join forces with community members and organizations to pursue an opportunity to foster real economic change and make a difference in both the local community and the region as a whole by using as a catalyst our region's French colonial history. The implementation of this project offers additional educational and economical op opportunities to capitalize on the already annual 45 to 50,000 visitors already in the area visiting Fort de Chart historic site or that attend a special event. Not to mention the, vis the visitors of Prairie Roaches. New visitors will travel and shop in the area attracted to the heritage shop and center specialty shops. There's a real expectation for an expanding hospitality industry in the area. One can find examples of such community impact and growth in the models of historic centers such as Connor Prairie in Indiana and William Williamsburg in Virginia. New expansion we know will not happen overnight but relies on the extent of the project over time and the real support of the community. Since 2018, this project has been presented to the Village of Prairie Rocha board members, Randolph and Monroe counties, 
Randolph County Economic Development and other regional and economical development organizations. We've also uh, presented our project to French governmental and, and cultural organizations, as well as those organizations supporting state and regional colonial history. Additionally, we have applied for and are in the process of pursuing potential grant opportunities, hoping to secure other potential funding avenues to begin this project. Thus far, we've received letters of enthusiastic support from our community and regional government and have yet to receive financial support. We do want to thank Greg Bull uh, at SIUE Illinois Support Small Business Development Center for his assistance in helping us create our business plan model, giving us a clear path for success and pursuing the Harry's Project in shock. We continue to work with our community to teach the history of our French and use that history to grow as a community and economically sustain for future generations. Um, so, you know, just to talk a little bit about the project, how Carol and I are dressed today is, is how we can, we'd like to perceive the community eventually all the time when someone comes to visit. Um, we've worked with the community, the, the Trade Road to Chamber of Commerce Tourism to develop a closet that we have here in town to develop motor clothing um, that people can do, um, develop more tours. We do get an influx of um, bus tours. We just signed a contract for 2022, 2023 for some um, cruise ships coming down the Mississippi that are going to come. So our doors are really starting to bustle because of tourism. Some of that it, uh, has a lot to do with St. Genevieve. Um, we work close with their tourism and their organizations. I see a lot of them in the room today. We work close with them to kind of cross, cross, um, do our tourism. But um, we, we would like to, to see more places like the Village Hall developed. We have plans for a point of interest, such as a Native American representation village, a small um, French village, which would include our education center, also serve as a tourism center. Our goal behind that is to teach local and regional people the artists and ways um, that they can in turn take those methods and turn them into economic incubators to, to open up little shops. We can have little pottery shops, basketry shops. There's so much history here um, that we can use that to develop our industry and our future. Um, in our development and growth. So um, the, I know that everyone was emailed out our plan. There's also some printed copies here if you haven't gotten it yet. But just again, thank you all for the support of it. We, we, um, we'd really like to see this happen. So um, we're, we're working hard towards it. Lots of different elements involved. So hopefully one day we can really see this town develop into what it, what it could be. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And I hope everybody had a chance to see the costume. This uh, really does add a, a layer of experience that um, takes us back to a different time, uh, certainly the same place, but a different time. And there's uh, a tradition that's so rich that I know in, in talking with uh, Carol and, and Jennifer, you sometimes said, oh, it's very common to see someone walking around town like that. It's not like it's out of the ordinary. It's really living and breathing who, who you are. And it's so authentic. It is not just a costume. It is really uh, an outward expression of, of who you really are and what you're embracing in terms of heritage and culture. And this living and breathing um, treasure is just as important as the bricks and mortar. And I hope that we start to understand how food weighs and the educational aspect of transmission of information is, is also at the heart of what we're here to talk about, protect, promote, and celebrate. Um, the next speaker uh, is Ray Cole. And he will be speaking to you all about this amazing vision, 300 years in the making and 300 years uh, vision for the future, uh, this levy district plan. 
which will help explain more of the nuts and bolts about some of the challenges that the community is facing, but also some of the uh, possible solutions and opportunities for partnership and hopefully lawmakers in attendance, um, business people, all kinds of, of different visions will come to understand these unique problems, situations, challenges, and let's do some brainstorming afterwards and see what we, we all uh, come up with. So um, without further ado, I'll introduce you to Ray. Welcome. It's really uh, exciting to see this kind of support in three of our community and so many struggles that we've been dealing with. Uh, we, uh, we have a long history, as, as you know, um, this deep fan, for those of you who read it, uh, Ray Rose was protected by a uh, running system as well as Port Charge. Um, and there's been a, the levy commission has been working by themselves and in conjunction with the board and uh, the village president um, ever since, you know, after the 1993 flood through 2000. Um, but they've not, that's all, they've been working on their own. And when I look at this organization coming in to support us and, and join us in this, it's really exciting. Um, as you know, uh, in the 2004, the levy was certified and we were no longer in the floodplain. And it gave us um, a little bit of a breather and a sense of relief. However, after Katrina, uh, with FEMA, we started to reassess, called it provisional, and it's been an ongoing struggle to try and keep where we had. In one sense, that in uh, <clears throat> 2009, uh, an engineering study was done to see what it was going to take to keep the levy viable. That was submitted uh, to FEMA, uh, which they deemed was uh, insignificant or insufficient, as you said, um, and needed more work done. The board and the levy commissioners had an ongoing effort to work with, with grants to build a regional authority. Uh, over the last 12 years, they've got approximately five grants um, in excess of $750,000. Those have been put to use, not only to pay for the engineering study initially in 2009, but to do uh, maintenance and modifications to the levy to make sure this region stays protected. Uh, <clears throat> and in, uh, it kept on. With FEMA kept on their activities, and we didn't seem to be able to make much of a damn top process for decertifying the levy and putting us in the floodplain. Um, Corps of Engineers offered to do another study, see if we could possibly get some more of it out of uh, FEMA and get the process stopped. However, we had to pay for it so, ourselves. That's where the Community Foundation came in through fundraising efforts. Donations. Um, we gave them ninety-two thousand dollars, and they came up with another study. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that was done in two thousand seventeen. That study showed that the levees had a problem with underseas. So, but they this time they did make recommendations. In the past, it was pretty frustrating working with them because they said we uh, were inadequate, but they didn't give us a program or any kind of suggestions about where or what we could do to uh, remedy the problems. Now with the report coming from the Corps of Engineers, we did have some suggestions in there. However, the government came in with price tag that says $69, which is if you look at Prairie Rocher, it's getting a little out of our uh, level. You know, we don't have a lot of resources. Uh, <clears throat> Obviously, it's an agricultural community and things, but of course, the next thing is tourism. And that's where we came in uh, with the efforts that uh, Jennifer led and uh, from the report. And it's been pretty 
lost some of it, but it seems to be going forward quite well. Um, in 2018, steering committee was put together uh, to come up with this strategic plan. And I think we all have a copy of this plan um, was handed out. <coughs> and let's say for those of you that are attending, otherwise, anyone that uh, would like a copy that doesn't have it, feel free to contact the village hall. Um, and uh, one will be shipped out to you. Uh, can be done either by uh, phone or email. Uh, and I don't know if anyone wants to take it or not, but it's the email pdrbc at htc.net. So I'll give you a quote there. <laughs> uh, but we'll be happy to ship you out uh, a packet um, to any place uh, for that. Um, and I would also like to say the steering committee that put this strategic plan together. Uh, and I think you know, a little pregnant thought is going to be on it. Uh, but they've done an excellent uh, job of not only reviewing the history and giving a backstory and a timeline of, of the struggles of what we faced here in Prairie Roger, but um, they've also outlined some. Strengths and weaknesses and our goals uh, will come. I will, you know, quite a bit. I'd like to take a minute to uh, acknowledge the people that work on the screen. Many of them are here. Um, Amy Barbeau, who at the time was uh, president of the Chamber of Commerce and also the Community Foundation, who was not able to attend. Um, Chris Martin, <laughs> and if you guys want to raise your hand, raise your lips. So, uh, you can put a, put a face for them. With uh, Randolph County Economic Development, uh, Craig Hearn, Vice President of HPC, who, um, and Tony Barbo, also with HPC, um, has been an awesome partner for the community. Uh, support us both financially and with um, their efforts to keep this community safe. Ed Wildbacher with Jeff Ed, your report district. Um, was very active. Uh, and it's Paul Ray is not here, he's in Red Bud uh, area with it, and myself. And then um, Steve Gonzalez, which is the chairman of the Levy Commission, uh, is not here today. But again, I can't say enough that the Levy Commissioners, you know, prior to the Prince Story Society uh, getting involved, all these efforts fell on. The levy commissioners and the, and the village board. Um, I'm myself being on that board. You uh, have two. Um, and, uh, um, you know, at times it was, it was a struggle that uh, you kind of felt like you were on a ship by yourself. Uh, and you're in a village this size with not a lot of resources. And uh, you're dealing with representatives from FEMA and Corps of Engineers. Um, they kind of had you out done. Uh, I know personally, I attended one meeting with Corps of Engineers, and I was invited to the two of us, and we walked in with 13 people. So it's, uh, it's really nice to see that, you know, maybe we've got an organization to help us here that, uh, you know, bring a little more weight to the table for us. Um, you see here in the future, you know, we're hoping now with the tourism. Um, being brought to the forefront and our efforts to national park status, uh, looking like a, a very viable possibility. I hope that it happens you know, within the next, uh, we're, we're hoping for the next few months. It'd be nice if this would happen for the 300. Uh, it would really give us you know, something to celebrate. Again, uh, I want to thank all of you for coming down here. Joining us here. Um, and if there's anything we can uh, do to help you do information on help bring it out, like feel free to contact us. We also have, in addition to the, the village hall, we have um, through Facebook um, and our website. Uh, that we can so, thank you. Thank you.
I think we need to all speak louder. I think I'm, I'm getting the message that uh, our location of our webcam is wonderful, probably to capture our in-person audience and hopefully your comments. But I think when we're up here, uh, it's a little little tricky for our sound to be captured. So I will try to speak louder. And um, I also want to encourage everyone else's voices to be heard. So. Uh, at this time, I would like to open it up for some questions and answers, uh, expressing the answers. So, um, does Lisa? Anyone... Yes, yes. Uh, this is Jim Kirkpatrick. I just wanted to say I got a text message from Brandy Bradley. Uh -huh. uh, she's on uh, the call. She couldn't uh, do it visually, but she's with the Delta Regional Authority. She's the Illinois designate to the Delta Regional Authority. Very nice. Another good, uh, a good in, uh, person to to join the, the, the group. So we've talked about a lot of things today. We've spoken about kind of a uh, the beginning of a process to gain national park status. We've heard that there's a lot of um, support from the state level, the federal level, that the new administration is aware of this effort. They seem interested. Uh, do we have any questions from the floor, from any of our guests uh, attending us virtually about this particular um, aspect of our morning's discussion? I have a question. This is a good question. Yes, this is a good question. Could somebody speak to uh, what the parameters of what's been proposed for the National Park uh, for Prairie to Road Research? Okay. I'm going to walk you out. Talk a little bit about that in the uh, strategic plan. We talk about the French Colonial District, and that is the large. Uh, it, it's in the map. It's in the book. Um, the large area that includes the very bottom. <clears throat> and um, but when you talk about a national park properties, so they're specific in nature, and the committee serviced several. And you need to have several in order for it to be considered by the National Park Service. And one of them is the Creole House. The other one is um, the Boost, Boost Lee House. The new House um, by uh, Steve Gonzalez. Another one is uh, the Pierre Menard Home, owned by IHPA. And then Fort Cass Cassidy. So those are specific properties. That would be with the park service. Okay. Now, there are others, but those others are not considered at this time because some are in private ownership and it would, everything has to be done with a willing owner, you know, seller type of thing, should that occur. But it doesn't mean it couldn't be done in the future. So, our French colonial district right now would be the, the large expanse. Would be the area of consideration, but specific buildings that would be part of a park service would be those that I mentioned just now. Okay. So Fort Deschartes is not the Fort is a very unique property, and it is also by IHPA or now IBNR. They would not want to move that to the federal side. And that is their choice. So it remains state. state but I think it's a very good symbiotic relationship to have both the state and the federal presence here promoting the area. And it will also, I think, benefit IDNR by concentrating more resources there and having the National Park Service support these other locations, of which have had some. Lack of maintenance over time. So uh, that would bring additional resources to the area. 
you know, obviously, there's a multi pronged approach within the strategic plan about even money protection and having greater federal presence to help us with that, but also um, visitorship will. It's going to increase significantly. We have the brand, uh, the National Park Service, which is considered to be the premier brand. And worldwide, people want to go to those sites. And you're on a, on a course to really take advantage of that. So that's yeah. a long answer. Mm -hmm. that's, that's good. Yeah. And would you mind clarifying what the IDNR uh, Okay. The Illinois Department of Natural Resources is the agency that currently oversees these properties. Now, at one time, Illinois had a separate agency called the Illinois Historic Preservation Agency. And two, three years ago, that was merged with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. So that's the agency currently that is overseeing these properties. Okay. Thank you. That was a great question. These are the yes, Carol. I would just like to say, at least light this up, um, that I think it's really important that everyone acknowledge, you know, it was very apparent to anyone who's here, the close relationship with Port and Chart and Prairie Rocher. We both benefit each other. The community depends on us for our special events and for our economic impact that we bring to the community. And that it is important from the state point of view that IDNR recognizes that importance. And so whenever uh, anyone has the opportunity to uh, be in contact or, or reach out with IDNR, that they stress the importance of Fort and Sharp. The state is pretty overwhelmed by the historic sites that they had to absorb into IDNR. They didn't ask for it, it was just given to them. So they've been trying to how to uh, how to deal with a, a historic site as opposed to a state park, and so um, we understand that we are supportive. But on the same token, we think that it is important that everyone lets the state know and an IDNR know how important Fort Shark is to this region. We try to stress it as often as we can. We are one of 50 some odd sites that they have to oversee in the state of Illinois. And as, as I mentioned, there are in the states of disrepair. That's why we've done our funding campaign to help support physical sites. Um, and along with all the other things, we present the special events, you know, uh, but uh, Lazy Me Report Shot presents the, the special events. But um, so we do everything we can to keep Fort Sharp visible. Uh, it's, it's clear that it is, uh, they give priority to those sites that have visitors. Um, and it's not about historical importance, it's about site visitors. So everything we do together to make Perry Rocher um, more successful and also impacts Fort Sharp. And likewise, whatever we do at Fort Sharp makes only the historic connection with Prairie Rocher even better. Carol, could you speak a little bit about these special events? What kinds of events are we talking about in case people aren't aware? We put on um, eight annual uh, special events a year. Um, uh, now, last two years, between flooding issues here in the region and the site is closed, and then the COVID, we have not been unable to do so, but um, we put on, with the help of our business community, we help um, financially back uh, these events. And um, thank you to HTC for their long-term support. Um, we bring over 45 to 50,000 visitors a year to the region. And not only here in Randolph County, but they stop in Monroe County, they have great importance. We have a huge annual events this year that we moved to September. Uh, and because of COVID, um, the annual Fort Sharp Rendezvous celebrated its 51st year. Um, and the community, all the surrounding communities, put on events that coincide with that to capitalize on the visitors coming to town uh, for those 
for that very large event. That's our single most, uh, we can bring up to 18,000 people just for that event alone. Uh, we have annual um, uh, spring in April, beginning of April and beginning of November uh, events uh, where we have reenactors from all across the country come in April to the April Trade Fair. And in November is the, uh, um, when around to do it. And those are, and, and that's the other component of this. We bring top of the line historic reenactors from all across the country who come here to Port Bichard. It is such a unique site to come to a stone French fort in the middle of North America. And they come to participate and be part and bring the quality of their representation of their uh, characterizations of that era. And we um, also have a, a kids day that we present where we have educational events for children, usually in early May. And then we have, um, uh, a, a French and Indian War encampments in October. Uh, we have La DNA in, in December, which is a historic, uh, uh, it happens on New Year's Eve, a French tradition that um, uh, is so important that it, all the French communities up and down the Mississippi River, uh, like St. Genevieve has one. Uh, there are different communities that still uh, have, have these, these uh, uh, celebrations that were very important to the French community. Um, and um, they have, uh, it, it's an actually a tradition that it was almost lost in France, that they learned to find out about the coming here because it remained here and was lost in the heritage of France itself. So there are just so many, uh, so those are those events that we plan annually each year. We reach out for business support, we get a lot of individual support, and through the actual event itself and the fees that we gather um, from the different, um, uh, we work with another support organization at Fort Sharp on the Prairie de Bois, and they, um, uh, between the two of us, we put on these special events and um, try to keep as many people coming to the board site because without visitors, it will it will not be done. Excellent, excellent information. Great answers. Um, we also talked about uh, in terms of this national park status. Uh, I'm getting all these texts. Uh, uh, that there's there's sort of a you know a balance between uh, having a national park and and these. Uh, working together with other entities. So I'd like to, you know, have everyone file this in our minds because this is exactly that kind of outreach, that relationship that you mentioned, whether it's state or potentially federally run parks uh, right, right next to one another. This is that kind of synergy that already exists and that we should all be thinking in those terms in terms of how can we extend this beyond this small community to uh, in a larger way how can we who come from chicago or from st louis or other places downstate or who have representation in washington how can we start building opportunities that grow not just this community and opportunities but to reach out beyond this particular area carol makes a, an excellent Case for this, like DNA. If this wasn't continued in this small community, this would be a cultural artifact that was extinct. This is about sustainability and about understanding in the 21st century that our resources run deep and they're not always the most obvious things like we have traditionally considered. These kinds of resources are our knowledge, our hearts, and our common traditions that could virtually be lost if we don't recognize that sometimes the biggest resource could be in hiding or a little tiny uh, corner someplace. This should not be the case. We need to clear the dust, clean it up, and really start living fully again. We're in a, an interesting time in our in our uh, 
nation's history and our world's history. This is, we're fortunate enough to today to have um, guests with us today from representing the French consulate. Um, later, I'm not sure if Martin Dion from uh, uh, Quebec is with us until this afternoon, but we have genuine interest that want to connect with us on deeper ways than we have perhaps before. So I hope that when we're thinking about our discussions, our questions, that we're all also keeping in mind that it does, the scope does expand way beyond uh, the community in Randolph County. This should feel like it extends much, much farther. We have friends here with us today from uh, representing the INM Canal and from Bourbonnet, which is um, outside of Chicago. But just hearing the, the name, we should already make the connection of there's a French heritage that we need to connect the dots. We need to fill in the blanks. And um, so I want us to start thinking in those terms as we continue to ask some questions and get some discussion going. So I, I also encourage all of our friends with us virtually, if you have questions, if you have a comment, please feel free to uh, unmute yourselves and join the conversation. And I want to you know, continue the, the, the chat now. So any other questions come to mind? After all that, <laughs> that can't possibly be possible. Um, okay, so we talked a lot about the national parks. We also heard about this very interesting uh, idea that would work in conjunction with a national park. And that is this living kind of community uh, with that Jennifer spoke to, spoke to us about. This would be about, um, if you can picture Williamsburg, Virginia. How many people here or virtually have been to Williamsburg, Virginia? Okay, so nearly more than half of us. So, have you? No. Oh, there was there. Okay, she's got to do her research. Um, this is the kind of experience where you do go back into time uh, and you start to understand a different way of life, different traditions, different art artisanal crafts, and uh, yet it's not a kitschy sort of thing. It's really allowing the history to remain alive. So Jennifer talked about the Heart of Illinois Countries Project. Does anyone have questions, suggestions, brainstorms about that kind of a proposal? That got me super excited. I kept thinking of all kinds of things. Uh, I thought of educational outreach ideas, bringing field trips here, as well as perhaps somebody from the community going elsewhere. Um, I, I think of the potage, which is a vegetable garden or an herb garden that you can see in Bois de Chart, but you can also see it here in town in Prairie de Rocher at the Pale House. When we go to St. Genevieve, there's also potage. This is the sort of thing when I think of uh, sustainable food and what's very chic now with the farm to table movement and uh, even slow food movement. This is where it all began in the 18th century, uh, not necessarily the French from the 1960s, we're talking the 1760s and before. These kinds of food ways, um, preserving and growing food, this is the sort of thing that is happening in this community. And um, I don't know if people are following what I'm talking about. If you have now some questions, what are what is Lisa talking about? What is a potage? What kinds of uh, food ways are we talking about? What the heck is slow food? I don't know where we're all at, um, but these are the kinds of things that are easily portable into other areas that can also resonate very much in your experience here. So does that generate some discussion or questions? Yes, I see some. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I'm Jim Paul with the Vertebrae Global Historical Society over in the northeast part of the state. 
and uh, we're part of the historic French Canadian Heritage Corridor, and it has signs along Interstate 57 indicating that uh, that those went up in 2015. What I would like to see is us come up with a name for what this entity is. I don't know, uh, French Heritage Midwest Waterway Corridor or something shorter than that from Missouri or Michigan that would include uh, uh, Wisconsin and Indiana, Vincennes, uh, Fort Vietnam. Uh, and on and in this entity, we then have a platform with not only a calendar of events, what Carol was talking about, what goes on down here, and we just we don't know. And how would you how do we find that and look at their specific website? If we had a, a central clearinghouse for not only what was going on, but uh, what else uh, uh, was happening with uh, the entities involved with the greater entity that was all French connected, I think that would be wonderful. I don't know how to go about doing that, and uh, but that would uh, enable us to share our. Uh, Intellectual resources and nothing else, since most of us are not for profit, it's hard to share too much. But we have fundraising abilities, and I think that's a, a good point, also. It's a great point, it's a great point. And uh, I want to restate a little bit about what was discussed. I'm hearing from our friends virtually that we're going to want to direct our voice kind of towards the webcam and as best as you can use your your full voice so that they can hear us um jim was mentioning how being uh an organization that's outside of this area trying to think about this this um greater corridor as you know we need to kind of come up with a name uh how do we encompass everything and uh, how do we draw on our various resources to um, maximize our effect? So in the afternoon today, you may have noticed on your agenda that we are going to be exploring a lot of these themes. And I really hope that our friends who are attending virtually will please stay with us, um, take your lunch break. You won't be uh, enjoying the delicious fried chicken that uh, all of us here are um, going to be treated to, but we certainly hope that at 1.30 today that you do uh, come back because that's when we're really going to start exploring those sorts of ideas. And, um, you know, that's a very, very good point. Um, yes, I, I had one question in the front and then we'll get, get to you. Go ahead, Sue. Following up slightly. Yes. Us, but it turns me the pool. And you were talking about perversion. This, the original, if one put it that way, is the provision of the wine outside, the need to France. If you could somehow anchor the thread of provisions that have been done over here in this part of French America, you could somehow then bring it to a central website of information of all your sites mm -hmm. and describe each one of them. This is what I'm talking about. So very nice point. This is key information that when we put our heads together and our collective knowledge, this is how we help each other. That was an amazing little gem. So if folks couldn't hear this, the, the origins of the Potager Garden was in Vexai. So similar time period, maybe a tad before those came to the Illinois country from France, but around the same time. And this tradition is still going strong in this community. The suggestion was, if you can make that link for people, that that would be very beneficial. And I think that's an excellent point. I could see the heads nodding. I could see the juices flowing. Yeah. You use the your work can bring from Versailles somebody who can speak to that thing, who can do all the various different places and or have an exchange from here. You yeah. will go there and see how they've done it there. You got it, Jane. So I'm nodding my head because my juices are flowing. This is what French Heritage does. We uh, have 
internship programs that we sponsor and an exchange between France and the United States. And you may have noticed in our slideshow that we showed what some of our um, past experiences are. We not only work on architecture, we also work on gardening. And these kinds of, of opportunities are absolutely uh, what we want to help facilitate. Laying the groundwork for all of this um, and helping to get support from all kinds of different entities and knowledge about what's available and putting it together is what it's all about. So, yeah. And um, just a little bit about my background. I am actually the volunteer curator of Important Shark. And I, I, Extraordinary. Am, I am an enthusiastic um, yeah, researcher of French colonial garden history. And that idea traces exactly from French Canada, Quebec, Montreal, where they have active period gardens all the way to New Orleans. And the whole style of gardening was brought from French. Uh, Canada down along the Mississippi to New Orleans, and you see it, well, you would have seen it over and over again, the same basic style. You see it in period maps that were drawn. So that's a wonderful idea of how to connect the continents through gardening. You know, the, the continents gardening history through through uh, a project like that. And the agricultural influence maybe so but yeah we can see that right very clearly how they tilled the soil and in fact from the ground seeds that have been shown by the Gina and Northern Andrew about this but the, the Hatari seeds that have sprouted up for all this time were in plants which are not native to this country. So yes yes and and so I think it's a it's a it's an app it's certainly an avenue to in which another avenue to pursue that would support uh, a wider knowledge and understanding of this region's history. I agree. Charles. <laughs> um, I subscribe uh, the French television program to this network, which is called TV5 Mold. And there's a lot of programs as a result of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And the people are going away in France from supermarkets where you have a direct connection established between French farmers and consumers. You have the same thing in Germany, it's called Lete Ausland, which is a phenomenal program. You have the same thing in Switzerland, and it's called basically from the farm to the table. My question about Gregory de Rocher, in that line, in that spirit, in a concrete manner, is this possible? Is this, do you have some local farmers who could actually provide return to some authentic products without chemicals, which then could be bought and consumed by people in the present negotiation? And when you have an event at Fogel Shop, those farmers could be, you know, I've been to all the reenactments. I've been coming to enactment here. Since 1985, I know them all. <laughs> this is when I met Margaret Brown the first time. And I still remember her son being 10 years old dancing. <laughs> I understand that you're only 10 years old. But be as it may, if you have something concrete, because you've got to have something concrete which will entice people to do something they can see. They can feed and they even can eat. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know the genetic research. I'm nodding my head because we, we actually started that path. So As part of our heritage project, we have a, a wheat revival project. So, Carol has researched a, a strain mm -hmm. of wheat that possibly would have been grown here 300 oh. years ago. So, what we started with is we planted it in the uh, uh, spot out of the fort. We have the right crop out here. Uh, and certain roads that the village once had with the community project, we painted that. Um, we're starting to entice local farmers to grow it. I myself have a half acre of it this year that we're going to harvest and do demonstrations. So the goal for this is to try to revive this historic wheat and the way that they farm it in this area to get more farmers to grow it. If you have enough producers, 
with very devotion to sell the red way to send you leave, you know, hopefully the, the ferry will work. And it sounds back in those <laughs> days when before Jennifer was born, in those days the school district of Prairie Devotion, the school was very much involved. And I, I forgot their names, but they were great people. Yeah. Margaret is around, perhaps she remembers them better than I do. And uh, you got to involve the school. You got to involve the teachers. And one of the things I did is for Saint Jean I put together, I still have it, I saw so much paper in my garage. Uh, uh, it's more of a library than a canyon built to rest and return to the garage. But eventually, I did a whole planning for history fair. You have a history fair local to involve the kids. And you have the kids talking to their parents, asking questions about the genealogy and what they already did. And then you could have an, an element with the farming, involve the kids, hands on. The kids love that. So if you can put together, working together with your school, you know, there's something which works. We actually do an education day that we invite uh, um, Missouri, Missouri County, Randolph County, Monroe County, and we have probably about 20 different stations set up that they dedicate to agriculture is one of them. Yeah, yeah. They, don't, they, don't look, they have to be publicized. That's very, very good. So to recap a little bit, there were some points made by Charles Nuzzi about uh, observations he's made from TV shows that are French talking about European uh, approaches to accessing food that is organic, exactly. local. Um, what comes to mind here in the United States is something called CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. Mm -hmm. And um, this is typically a formula where whether it's it's um, restaurants or individuals can basically give seed money, purchase their share for the coming growing season. That way the farmers have the funds to grow all of the food and they know that they're going to have people who are going to use that food. There's usually set up places where the food is picked up. Sometimes you can pay a little extra and it will be delivered. This obviously works very, very easily in uh, urban communities, but it's a much bigger challenge in a rural community. So these are things that would have to be considered vis-a-vis -vis this particular area. Doesn't mean it can't happen, but that would be a big challenge. Um, Getting also back to your comments about uh, the educational app outreach and how some of these food ways with the wheat, for example, that are being grown in the same manner in which they were grown back in the 18th century and the same strains of wheat, that's important for so many reasons. Um, it's not monoculture, it's more sustainable, et cetera, et cetera. And this is another teaching moment. Um, it's also historic in the sense that um, very few people realize that the bread basket was the Midwest of New France before the revolution. Um, New Orleans wouldn't have survived without the wheat grown in this region. So this is really important. The Mississippi River was that transportation system. This is way before planes, trains, and automobiles. So we have to go back to think of a different way, but this is where it was grown and then transported. And so if they can do it back in the 18th century, then surely we can figure out how to do a CSA in the 21st century. It's just a new challenge that we have to get wrap ourselves around. Um, I actually have a question um, in terms of the educational aspect. These are the sorts of things, another point was made. How do we, Charles made, how do we get this into the schools? So much of the history that is American history, even if it is pre-revolutionary, is not really well known and it's not really being taught. 
So my question is to Illinois lawmakers, to our lawmakers that uh, have representation in Washington, and even our friends um, from France and abroad. Why is this so? Why is our history not really known? I have grown kids now that um, I have a 24 year old and a 21 year old, and um, they don't know anything about any of this history, and they're from Illinois. Why are our schools not teaching our history? And I ask that on a local level, a state level, and a federal level. Could somebody speak to that? <laughs> Is anyone answering? Dr. Martina. Oh, Dr. Martina. Welcome, Dr. Martina. Welcome. Dr. I don't know if I have any great answers for the questions that you raised. Uh, certainly, having been a regional superintendent of schools for this area, it certainly has always been on my mind that we did do a very good job of teaching local history. Uh, you know, we're required in the middle school level to teach something about Illinois. Certainly, it doesn't require us to teach something about Randolph County or the French Colonial District or all that we have here. Uh, one of the things that we started in 2016 is something we call our Randolph Society. And if you look at Randolph Society, uh, Google or whatever, you will see that for the last four or five years, we have highlighted individuals who, through their efforts, made contributions to Randolph County. For instance, just this last year, we highlighted the black soldiers of, of Randolph County, many of whom came from Prairie de Rocher and the Sparta area. Many of them had French ancestry. And the cool thing about these guys, it was in 1865 that they joined the military to fight on the Union side. And think about that, the whole conflict is is slavery, it, it's all of the issues that we have with the North and the South, and they felt compelled to join the fight, let us say. And um, it's a fascinating story, and you can read all about them. Uh, names like Meshaw and different names of people from this particular area. And we had uh, at least 12 soldiers that signed up in 1865 to join us. So, I know I'm adding to your basic question, yeah. and I don't know if I, I if I have the answer would be that we we just have not done, it. and mm -hmm. we take I guess for granted in many of the communities here what we have. Certainly, if you talk to the ladies in the Fort Sharp folks, uh, Jennifer and those. We've done a wonderful job of trying to promote Fort Sharp and all that we have down here that uh, I think we all feel that we could do a better job of it, but uh, uh, we have a gem down there. And if we can turn it into a national park and get that status, we're hopeful that uh, it will help us grow not only in reputation, but in just the knowledge that people have about our area. So I guess we just have to like well, thank you for this because it it holds a lot of uh, gravitas when we hear an actual educator, someone who has worked in this area and in that field, um, who can speak directly to the fact that this simply has not been the transmission of information, and, and it, it just simply hasn't happened. So. Once again, I'm going to pose my question to some of our lawmakers who are joining us. Can you, it's not so much a, um, uh, you know, what happened in the past. It's about what do we think about that now and what kinds of, of um, approaches might we take to remedy that? And I, I defer to any number of you or all of you to, uh, you know, weigh in if you would. Lisa? Yes. I, I, can everyone hear me okay? <laughs> hear great. Probably better than sound than anyone's heard today. 
uh, just for introduction, my name is Colby Bartlett. I'm the director for the We Ought Non Preserve National Historic Landmark in Tippecanoe County, Indiana. Um, we're one of your neighbors in the during the period of the Illinois country. We were one of your eastern uh, neighbors, and you know, one one of the challenges that we're dealing with is the we're kind of a little bit hamstrung by the current political boundaries of our states uh, when historically. Uh, you know, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois was all part of the same area, um, at least loosely. Um, but just to follow on, the the, the paradigm in in, America, in modern American education kind of tends to be a, a dichotomy where we have STEM subjects, and then everything else that's not STEM is the arts, and obviously on a national, inter global level, the emphasis is on STEM education. Um, and I think one of the, one of the things that we've been experimenting with and, and had some success with is finding ways to cross over history, archeology, span um, and incorporate it into STEM subjects. And by doing that, it, 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 it helps advance our cause. Um, you know, it's probably going to be a long, long time before ever these subjects, history, and things that are, that are lumped into the arts are ever given the priority that, that the um, STEM subjects are. And, you know, one of the ways that we might adapt and overcome with that is to, again, start finding ways to integrate history into those STEM subjects, or at least look at history through the lens of science, technology, and math. So just a thought. Thank you. I, thank you. I think those are very, very good points that, that again, thinking uh, a little bit outside of the box and understanding that to learn math and science, you don't just have to do a bunch of numbers on the board, that there's opportunities, certainly in, uh, again, going back to the potage. I mean, I think of the, the uh, edible school garden projects of uh, Slow Food and Alice Waters. This is exactly what they're talking about. An entire curriculum can be done in a garden. You can talk about history, you can talk about science, you can talk about math, you can talk about all kinds of things, certainly about uh, recycling and, and good healthy practices. So there's all kinds of opportunities um, wrapped up and encapsulated in, in one a uh, little topic like that, but talking about um, how how does this process work? What can our lawmakers help uh, us better understand about how do changes happen in our curriculum? Um, is it something that's legislated? Is it something that's uh, done in a different kind of way? What kinds of experts are brought in to weigh in on what might be needed? How does this work? I'll follow on just with one more uh, anecdote. Um, one of the examples that we've been successful in doing this was uh, with Fort Wiatnon, we don't have a reconstruction or a, uh, or a preserved site. It's all archaeological. And we were able to engage with a group of Purdue students a couple of years ago who digitally recreated Fort Wiatnon. And so it was, it was a, a wonderful example of history, archaeology, bridging that gap with science and technology, um, specifically with computer science, to be able to, to take the information that we knew um, his historically from the historical references, the information that we've gleaned from the archaeology, as well as uh, using a little inference from what we know about other contemporary early 18th century French sites in North America and, and creating a, a, a visual representation, uh, a fairly accurate one of what Fort Wiatnon would have looked like. So there's just kind of one example of, of that kind of a, of a marriage or crossover. I, I would um, 
uh, maybe add on to what the gentleman just said, which is we have um, at our disposal for many things, uh, Southern Illinois University, both in Edwards, the Edwardsville campus and the Carbondale campus. Uh, because um, schools uh, are having difficulty, I mean, I, hopefully we're going to be out of this COVID era soon and, and kids can actually travel. But even after travel begins again, it's becoming very cost restrictive. So uh, just to get them introduced, the virtual aspect is always uh, a welcome uh, a part of, uh, of the equation. Um, as far as legislating it, um, I, I think you cross into the realm of uh, philosophical issues, which are uh, those that believe in local control and those believe that it should be handled at a state or national level. So it is really difficult to get curriculum uh, approved specifically uh, through the Illinois uh, General Assembly uh, because of those philosophical differences. But I would say that you can make a lot of headway by inviting in uh, the associations that represent school boards, uh, the superintendents, the principals, and the teachers. So if you um, bring those organizations in, I'll, I'll give you an example of something that's been very successful, and that is the um, Holocaust Museum in Skokie has this large, uh, I'm going to call it a trunk. It's a great big box of information that is sent to the school for, to schools at no cost uh, to allow them to study uh, Holocaust for the mandated uh, section that they have to do on Holocaust education. So it's possible that as we put together uh, this uh, French historic corridor and have that available to them, if we can do both uh, video and also that kind of a presentation where there's some hands-on stuff that can go to the schools, that will get them interested enough that even if the school can't visit the sites, that'll get them there with their parents. Thank you so much, Senator. That's really excellent um, uh, thoughts. And, and I'm thinking even of like teacher packets, what you're kind of thinking of. And perhaps if the students can't come here necessarily, sometimes it might be that somebody from here gets farmed out. No pun intended. Now we have a bunch of hands going on. This is exciting. So, and I never recognized you. You had a comment a long time ago. And so let's hold our thoughts for a moment and I'd like to uh, direct it to you. Go ahead. No, thank you, Wadey. I, I, uh, my name is John Carroll. I'm on the board of directors of the Foundation for Restoration of St. Genevieve, Missouri. And I wanted to bring greetings from upper Louisiana <laughs> in terms of neighboring <laughs> French cultures. And uh, although we, certainly recognize that there are important historical distinctions to be made and that the river, in addition to being a communication, was at various periods of history an international boundary as well, and it did result in some cultural divergences. However, we on the west side of the river want to applaud and support what you're doing over here. We very strongly recognize the historical links between the east and west sides of the Mississippi River. And we hope that you can continue to progress. We, we've got our hands full right now with our own national historical park. I think it's gonna be a wonderful thing for our whole area, but hopefully that can, in various ways, complement what's happening on this side of the Mississippi River. Thank you so much. That's really lovely to you know, talk about neighborly and it's like cousins, right? You know, we're all like this one extended family and, and this kind of coming together and having that, that goodwill and working with one another, it does just, it helps everyone. So very, very nice point. Um, I had some more hands, Mark and, Go ahead. Yes. Jim Paul again from yeah. the Blue Gold Historical Society. What we have done with the local history um, problem and trying to get the word out is that in our revamp website, we have a YouTube channel, GHS YouTube channel, and we have uh, the first of several episodes of local history in which I conducted a webinar. And it was uh, entitled Pottawatomie Carroll, because often our area of Pottawatomie were the natives that were 
forced to make the decision on what to do with the Republican Removal Act of 1830, and I put uh, participants in their democracies to make that decision, and what would that decision be? And then they would have a person who actually lived accompanying them as they went, as they go through the program and find out what that person decided and how that person turned out, that part of water. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they eventually uh, interview with uh, Noel Lavaster, one of the early French Canadians who I portray. And so uh, it, it gets to the French Canadian, uh, 1820s and 30s, it ends in 1838, that first episode, but it also begins in the 1700s with New France. Uh, it's the first of many episodes. I think it's a way to get the word out. I even have a, a narrative with the slides that teachers and even people can use. And I think that's something that we as our own organizations and societies have a responsibility to do because the uh, educators, uh, as we've heard, uh, the teachers, they're limited by what they have time to teach and what they have to teach according to the standards. And the test. So, local history and other history sometimes gets that wrong. But all history begins with local history. Okay, right. Mark? I, I would agree. And, and let's just go back to the basics. Mm -hmm. Having been a teacher in the classroom myself, having worked as an administrator and a principal with other teachers, I can tell you, as you were mentioning, there is stress upon teachers. To produce a product. Now, when I was young and I was going to school, I think things that mattered were what helped me in my heart and what helped me with my creative endeavors. Those things seem to have been put on the back burner when it comes to, as the gentleman mentioned, the STEM curriculum and those things that were tested each year. And let's face it, those test results come back. And it grades those schools to determine whether they're a successful school, a quality school, or not. And so the pressure is there for teachers to teach a certain amount of curriculum so my child will do good on the ISAT tests or the tests that happen each spring in order for my school board to recognize that I do a good job in the classroom and that we have a good school. Now, honestly, that is necessary, all right? And as an educator, I can tell you that we need to educate their minds, but their hearts as well. And we need to understand where we come from and what we're made of and why some of us have certain names in our family because maybe your, your dad's name was Oscar and my great grandpa's name was Oscar and why we come back to uh, the history that we have, not only in our families, but in the areas where we, we live. I think that's wonderful that you did that, that those uh, broadcasts can be made. As I was saying with the Randall Society, it's the same thing. Um, you know, you can go on our website and you can see pictures of the Hunter brothers who set a world distance record in 1928 and flew 23 days straight without landing. And you can see films of that, and it's great history of what happened in our area. So if we could ever get to the point where we educate the whole child, and we're not so driven by math and science standards, and more by the local history of our area, then I think we will come to the point where we educate both the hearts as well as the minds of kids. It's hard for a lot of our educators right now to exist in the system. Yes, Ed. Uh, <clears throat> Going on the educational theme a little bit, uh, Madison County Superintendent of Schools uh, last week issued a uh, challenge to the students of uh, Madison County related to another national park effort, and that is the Pokemon Mountain Mississippi and Culture National Park, as there is a congressional bill for the House and Senate on that. Mm -hmm. And he challenged the students to write letters of support for that and also to do posters that are due at the end of this month so they can build more public support for that. That's something here that took it in school to do too as we move into 300 years celebration for Rocher, but also 
should we get a, a bill introduced in Congress for the National Park, which we don't have yet, but it can happen. Now, I think some, uh, I think Senator Duckworth was waiting for the Wisconsin said to get done to introduce a bill, but I think it could be done even sooner than we get a bill going and maybe that can be some of that educational outreach efforts. Um, I'm also going to comment, I used to live in Bourbon A. Bourbon A? Yes, I did, uh, back in the 80s. And um, I believe it was the mayor there during one of their celebrations, I don't know if it was 100 years or whatever it was, um, decided that it was called the Bones. Yes. No. Yes. And locally, it was known as the Bones. And everybody, you know, everybody said, wow. But the mayor decided. I think it was on the celebration of their September 1975. And they should call it Burt Man and we keep your cultural change within the community. So maybe the mayor could say, for our 300th anniversary for Rochester, mm -hmm. we go very good Rochette. Mm -hmm. And we kind of get cultural change as, you know, the cost of it to do that, but it, it makes mm -hmm. us think a little bit more about what our French heritage was. I gotta retrain my brain again. But everybody today, <laughs> everybody today knows his Burt Man. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, those are excellent points. Yeah, really great. Really excellent. Jennifer, did something come to mind? Yeah. Um, speaking of the, the education, um, when when our support organization saw the void for local history um, about five years ago, um, we filled that void by just going directly to the school, mm -hmm. with the superintendents, and um, with the help of the Illinois Humanities Grant, we created an educational book that we took with in all the schools. Um, and then we have a big education. Go back to the camera. That's, that's me. There's yeah. camera. Um, yeah. So what we did is we developed an education day and we developed a book that we developed the material. And then we reached out to the superintendents and we invited them to the education day, gave them our material. And then they started revolving around that and doing a week long lesson plan. We give them kits that have historic items in them that we drop off to the schools that they can study for the week. They bring that back. Uh, but the point behind all of this is we didn't sit back and wait for things to change. We brought it to them. And then they said, well, we didn't we didn't know this existed. Now that it's here, we're going to use these tools and we're going to teach this history. So we get to make change that any schools locally are ourselves. They were already teaching the French and Indian War. So along with that, now they are all implementing you know, the lesson plans that are giving them about what the sharp and the region. So. so those are those are very good points about how sometimes one must take matters in our own hands that go directly to what what were we seeking change we want people to know more about something you go to them you tell them um, and you develop these sorts of things it sounds like the Illinois Illinois Humanities Council was uh, playing a big role yes, in Mark, that uh, how that uh, helped us get that he's from uh, southern Illinois and very passionate about the history he's the one that kind of uh, cut into that but yeah there's when education is, is concerned, there's all kinds of, of elements for help. And, and the teachers, a lot of times, you know, when we say, oh, why haven't you been to Fort Bishart in the past? They said, been invited. It hasn't been put in front of us. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, that's where if we're going to teach the history, we've got to go to them and put it in front of them instead of waiting for it to come all the way down. And in Illinois, if I can say that one of the biggest challenges we have is now is, you know, Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, and that's where a lot of state money goes to those, those sites that support that narrative and that history. And so, even when you meet people, they have no idea that you know we're not state. Um, we're the that, land of Lincoln. That, at, at, that that's yeah. where everyone's focus is, and so breaking that cycle is going to be a challenge. Well, you know, I'm hearing comments here, and you know, we fall. I think oftentimes we all seem to continuously fall into this zero sum uh, game mm -hmm. mentality. It's this or that. I want us to like really change our mindset. Mm -hmm. It we can have all of that. So as much as um, I am uh, a, a language and history person and I'm terrible at math. I recognize the importance of STEM education. 
but why is it a need or work? You know, these are the kinds of things that to we're full people, we need to enrich all aspects of ourselves. These all should be included. And you know, the same idea with all these other ideas, but it's it is a land of Lincoln, and, and that's amazing. But it's also the land of Cahokia mounds, and it's the land of all kinds of other things. And for us to forget about all these other things, we're really missing out on something. And uh, oh, I, I have hands going up. I feel compelled to stand and confess that I am only here today because my husband represents Cahokia. But I want to tell you that our St. Teresa Academy of 1971 is deciding where we're going to have our 50th class reunion. Should we go to Illinois or should we go to Missouri? And everyone on the Zoom call, of which I listened, I didn't even want to watch, said, is it safe in Missouri? Right. And someone said, you went to school in East St. Louis. Is it safe anywhere? Are we safe in our own home? Are we safe in our own community? I always say to people, you're safe everywhere, mm -hmm. but you have to be aware. Awareness is ever important. That's lovely. And, and it's something that I always think, you know, when you don't go and see for yourself and you go uh, on, on um, either what somebody else has said or perpetuating a belief that may not be completely accurate, these are some of the pitfalls we all fall into if we don't um, see for ourselves and make these exchanges. We cannot um, live in fear and keep barriers. So these are all like, they're sentiments, but they're all important things that go into the nice stew that we're starting to cook here, um, that we need to start thinking differently or we're just not going to get anywhere. We have to start wanting to go. I, I would answer, why can't we do both? Go to Missouri and Illinois for your thing. I mean, don't you want it all? Why, why wouldn't you want to see both and, and, and enjoy? Have one evening here and the next day there. Um, this is what we have to start. So can, can I... If can I jump in for just a second? Um, again, I, uh, to, to that point, my mother graduated from East St. Louis uh, Senior High School, had their 50th just a couple of years ago. I went as her date uh, for the East St. Louis 50th, and they did just what you're describing. They did part of it in Collinsville and Belleville and part of it in St. Louis. So um, happy uh, 50th class reunion. Yeah. Nice, nice input. Uh, yes. Julie. Lisa, my question is to you. I'm Julie Pimpercoy from Kansas City and I've been from Kansas City. Um, it's really what the role of the contrarian society could be. Because what I see coming a bit from out of the, these regions is that you have so much wonderful heritage, those great groups that are so vibrant. You really need an entity that's going to bring it all together in this French heritage corridor. And I think maybe the French Heritage Society, this is what you're about, and you have a staff in your head. Does Chicago, do you have some kind of staff or not? We do not. You do not. So it would really be getting that together to say this is something that's really important to the French Heritage Society that is a 501c3, to be great for fundraising and things like that, but you really almost need to create this idea of the French Heritage um, Corridor. Have it sponsored by the French Heritage Society, which makes a lot of sense. You already have the connections with France and the United States. You have a fundraising arm, but really, maybe say we need to hire some staff to run this to have a small director. Because I look at, um, I don't know if anyone's been to Red Crab in Nebraska, it's just this amazing place that it has the little cabin language. And it's kind of amazing that this small town has this mission, and your mission, of course, would be French Heritage in this. Um, corridor, but they've created a center which could be at the, the 
the show of the show. I don't know how you decide that you won't change your name. Which I can see, I think that's really rather common. Um, but you can have a center that becomes its own vibrant community, you know, and have an academic, I think you need an academic advisory board, but you need to have that entity that supervises it. And do you think that the French Writers Society would be willing to step up and start something like that? Well, for starters, I I um, cannot speak on behalf of French Heritage Society's <coughs> executive board uh, like that. However, I do know that they are committed to um, promoting, preserving uh, French heritage, not just in France, but certainly in the United States. And as we all know, this portion of the United States is sort of ground zero for that. So we are absolutely committed to um, working towards fostering the educational uh, exchange. We are absolutely committed to finding ways that we can help um, raise money to support that. And I also believe that we're in an interesting moment to maybe reassess a bit and find new ways that French heritage can um, develop and get more involved in this Midwest corridor. And so having these kinds of discussions and getting everyone together and having um, an exchange of ideas, I think will help French Heritage Society better help this kind of an effort. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's almost about laying the groundwork. We need to reestablish these connections. And, and we'll go over more about that in the afternoon. Um, we have just a couple of minutes before we do take our break. And I um, uh, wanted to just acknowledge what, what Ed shared with us that um, the, the uh, okay, I'm getting distracted, um, that you made some really valuable points about the political system. And uh, I wanted to, you know, before we broke, kind of, you know, connect with that. And um, the, the lawmakers, um, I think, can play a little role in bridging this. And um, I don't know if any of uh, the lawmakers want to make a comment about uh, some of the, the discussion we've had. But in terms of the national park, it seems to me that uh, we don't have all of the answers. And so you were touching on the reconnaissance survey or whether or not we should have an act in Congress. And I know for some other national park efforts, there have been uh, those sorts of things made. And I'm questioning whether or not uh, some of our friends from Senator Duckworth or Senator Durbin's office could speak to us about is that a possibility? Would that be a consideration that um, that sort of uh, proposed legislation would be made in conjunction with this um, effort to get national park status uh, through the reconnaissance survey and going through um, the Secretary of Interior? Is there another layer of that? I think. Uh... From my understanding, too, uh, there could be uh, action taken uh, through Congress itself, you know, and uh, I, I know uh, when I talk to Tim Good with the National Park Service, there's a totally different process you can go through uh, by putting a bill in through the Senate and the House, and in a way, it, it kind of bypasses that. Uh, but again, it would have to get a majority of votes in both houses and it would have, have to be signed by the president. And it's not really done that way. But uh, talking about local history and uh, the fact that you brought up, uh, you know, from my experience, uh, it seems like most of the local history that we know in our area is a result of some of the school teachers that were in the area that had a real interest in uh, preserving the history. Uh, one person in particular that comes to mind is Mike Jones, 
in Murfreesboro. Uh, Murfreesboro was the home of General John A. Logan, uh, a Civil War general and, and later a United States Senator. He ran for vice president uh, in 1884 and he was the founder of the Grand Army of the Republic. Um, Mike did a lot of exploring in Murfreesboro and actually brought in school children uh, to help do archeological digs. And, and uh, several years ago, there was an instructor at uh, SIU Carbondale named John Allen. And John had a, a particular interest in local history and he would do a weekly column called It Happened in Southern Illinois. And then he did like uh, something called Jackson County Notes, Randolph County Notes. And when I was small, they actually used those booklets in school to give a little uh, history of the area. Yes, Ed. Uh, I'd like to build on Jim's comments about the legislative process. Uh, what he described was going through Congress, getting a bill introduced, and getting it passed with some of the president. Okay, that's very traditional way. It's a long process. There's another mechanism, and that comes a national park through that congressional act. Another mechanism is a national monument. Equal in stature for the national park. But it takes the ink of the pen of the president declare a national mind. Okay, so they're equal. And so the president could do it immediately if he chose to do so. And getting our legislators to work with us to make that happen, and we can do both in a way and go whichever one happens first. And we do have a deadline next year, 300 years, to celebrate. And it'd be great to be able to have either he signs a law or he signs for a park or he signs a declaration for a monument. Either one would be what we need to do by next year. So we can do one of those things. Did everybody virtually hear Ed? I want to make sure that he, everyone could hear his voice. I see William nodding. Okay. <laughs> well, it just turned uh, straight up noon. So this is a perfect time for us to take our break. Um, I sincerely thank everyone for joining us this morning for um, your valuable insights, your uh, information. And at 1.30, we'll reconvene for our afternoon session. We'll have um, uh, Charles Dunsby giving us some real good grounding with uh, some historic information. And then I would, um, uh, we'll be having a nice roundtable discussion about some of the topics that are listed on your agenda. I hope that our friends uh, attending virtually uh, will, will rejoin at 1.30 and um, I wish everyone a good I hope this had a nice lunch. And it was glorious outside. It was wonderful to uh, get some fresh air and enjoy and, and uh, chat a little bit. It's always hard to come back from that that uh, beautiful outdoor weather and, and come back. And uh, yet here we are. So we're. Um, I want to welcome some of you. May uh, be new. A uh, few people were coming for our afternoon session. So I want to say, wish you all a good afternoon. Bonjour. Um, I'm Lisa Khan. I'm your host and co-chair of French Heritage Society Chicago chapter. With 11 chapters in France and the United States, FHS is committed to ensuring that the treasures of our shared French architectural and cultural heritage survive to inspire future generations to build, dream, and create. Building upon the core mission of the French Heritage Society, the Chicago chapter is committed to amplifying French cultural heritage, which includes foodways, arts, architecture, and garden design in the Midwest and in France. Our focus is to give priority to the Midwest. 
this region. It's represented by the French consulate based in Chicago. It's a pretty vast area. Our goal is that our rich Midwest French heritage and history is preserved, shared, and researched Enjoy throughout areas of the Midwest where the French historically traveled, traded, and lived. 30 years ago, the Mississippi River flood disaster hit the French Heritage Corridor, and that's what straddles Missouri and Illinois. The French Heritage Relief Committee was founded to save, restore, and protect key national resources and the communities in which they were located. The French Heritage Relief Committee successfully promoted the renewal of ancient links between France, New France, and what was known as the vast territories Territoire de Dénois helping to reaffirm the French cultural roots of the two great states of Illinois and Missouri. The French Heritage Society Chicago chapter is resurrecting this effort, which is strongest when we work together for the betterment of all. Under the leadership of Dr. Charles Bellissy, a French-born historian living in the Midwest, the French Heritage Relief Committee became a coalition of leaders in Chicago coming from the Alliance Française, the French American Chamber of Commerce, the delegate of the government of Quebec, and the Consul General of France. Distinguished leaders from St. Louis, such as Les Amis, the delegate to the Conseil Supérieur des Français de l'Étranger, the Fédération des Alliances Françaises USA, as well as leaders from the National Trust of Historic Preservation rally. The ambassador of France, the two senators and a congressman from Missouri, the governors of Missouri and Illinois, they all joined this valiant effort. The colonial dames of St. Genevieve stepped up as did hundreds of people of Illinois Native American and French lineage. One of the most effective supporters was Princess Marisol de la Tour de Vannes, president of Les Amis de Vieille Maison Française, the forerunner of French Heritage Society. Through their efforts, the groundwork was laid for the creation of a national park in Saint Genevieve, Missouri, and the Liberty Bell of the West, a gift from uh, gift in 1740 from Louis Cannes in Kaskaskia, Illinois, was restored. Today, no flood is threatening our national treasures, but the specter of failing infrastructure and a lack of economic development is a different type of deluge in the making. There are big needs which require a concerted and sustained focus. It's time to recreate an association to answer these challenges. Together, we can build a coalition of organizations and leaders to work toward the creation of the French Heritage Corridor and the creation of a national park here in Prairie de Rocher, Illinois. Together with St. Genevieve National Park and many other affiliates, the initiative will prove to reaffirm cultural and economic ties between the Midwest, France, in Quebec province for the 21st century and beyond. In so doing, we will ensure the health of local Midwest communities by providing the groundwork for sustainable tourism and commerce. By no means does a synergistic initiative such as this one threaten autonomy or uniqueness. As a network, the French Heritage Corridor simply but profoundly will provide strength and support to preserve, promote, and celebrate our shared treasures of French heritage in North America. We need your insights. We need your involvement. You're a vital part of this renaissance. This is a call to action. This afternoon, we will explore our common ground 
and develop strategies to meet our mutual needs. This will be a roundtable discussion format. So everybody's voice and ideas count. To prime our creative problem solving skills and to help focus our efforts, I am so thrilled to introduce our next speaker, an expert in 18th century history of the Illinois country, Charles Belize's passion and dedication for creating our French heritage corridor is an inspiration for us all. He is truly notre avant-garde. Wow. <laughs> First of all, I'm going to do a whole trick of academia. I keep my watch off and I keep my watch in front so I know when to stop. Because, as you know, you can take the boy out of academia, but not academia out of the boy, and you never know when to stop. <laughs> well, <clears throat> thank you very much. It's a real pleasure. And a pleasure and a surprise. I'm still surprised to see some people still have kept the faith. No, like Margaret Brown and I, now because the very first time I came to Crater du Rocher, I was um, exploring the area I was about to write about. Um, to make a very long story short, when I got my PhD, uh, tradition goes, you go to your alma mater, University of Illinois, and ask them if they would take your thesis and my thesis was about black troops in the French army in colonial times. And they said to me, no, that's not our specialty. I'm glad they did because Brandeis published it. They say, however, if you ever write about the state of Illinois, come back to see us. So once I took care of my black troops in the French army, I start looking and I realized very quickly that the state of Illinois was not it was a much deeper, more important story, which was the, the presence of the Territoire des Illinois ou la haute Louisiane, whatever the name, which was the French plantation. But if you write about something, you've got to know what you're writing about. So the very first time I took the Highway 3 and I turned at Rumor 1, 155, and I drove down and suddenly it was a little canyon, wooded canyon, and you were in great devotion. And it was a different world. And it's still, for me, I still have that sensation of different world, separated by those magnificent cliffs from anything else, from Roma, from, from Redbird, from Sparta, nothing to do. It was a unique world. And, and right away I was captivated, of course, then I went to the Fort de Sharp, and to make a long story short, I wrote many, many reactions, including in July, dying in a French uniform in the summer. I mean, this is six of this stuff. I also did reenactment in the winter, I suppose, with your father in law shooting outside. I mean, we did a lot of stuff. So, to say that I'm a passionate about this place, you know, it's an understatement. Nevertheless, to passion, you have to bring reality. And the reality, you know, for me, is was there is an area which is unique to the United States because it's true, it's not fake, it's not made up. It's this area on both sides of the Mississippi, both sides of the Cascadia River, of the Inner River, of the Wisconsin, which represented a part of history that the United States has long ago not only ignored but completely ignored and why should we have to be in front technology and i we don't, we don't talk the same language so it, it's a uh, unique because it's real and like any cultural historical treasure is, is worth protecting now we are interested in conservation history and so on. But again, we have to be realistic. We fight a, a good war, but then most of the time we fight alone. And worse, we fight individually, ignoring each other, which is a big mistake. 
This is why long ago, and when you were talking about the state, you know, it's the historical society. I still have a two page pamphlet. I, I, I keep a lot of stuff where I put down the principle and try to get together. We can work together, et cetera, et cetera. But basically, this idea remains the same. We uh, have experienced a lot of crisis, and recently, uh, Americans not being able to go abroad rediscover the United States, which is a perfect opportunity to rediscover this area. But in order to attract tourism, you need an infrastructure. And what strikes you right away, if you look both sides, even St. Genevieve with the Audubon Hotel, which I knew when it was a St. Genevieve Hotel, I fell in with the pitch. <laughs> that was my good friend, her father, who did phenomenal stuff. But you look at it, there are seven rooms. Of course, you have another hotel. Uh, but you look on this side, and what strikes you, we don't have an infrastructure. And if you don't have infrastructure, meaning people who can eat and, 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 and don't have to drive back to St. Louis, and don't drive back to whatever it is, your tourism will not survive. And we need tourism in order to support conservation. If you want to convince people that culture, that history is worth it, you have to also call to their interest. And this is a basic everywhere. People will support if they, are, if they are interested in a way of enjoying it. So the first question is to ask, how can we improve? How can we remedy this lack of infrastructure? This morning, Erin and Jim, my good friend, we came by the, the ferry. Mr. Hillman was himself playing deck hand, will you believe it? You cannot find a deck hand. And he said, well, I'm going to run into 10. This is, you need, we need a communication in between the two sides of, of the river. And those are part of the infrastructure, which maybe you have to observe. This infrastructure is needed if we want to help develop, maintain the cultural heritage we have. And that, of course, is an essential part. Now, in order to gather all those people who do phenomenal things, I learned from Mary this morning that you say there's a map from an uh, engineer. Tell me what it's about. Uh, what the map uh, they met uh, about the river road the map we were talking about. Uh, so it says, uh, I've got to the coal engineers coming up with something new. There's a lot of good things happening everywhere. And many times we come individually, nobody knows about it, and we discover Atlanta. Therefore, there's a reason to consider, to find a way to federate our efforts. And I've been preaching this story for a long time. Well, lately, back in October, we were at, uh, uh, my friend and I we were at Chomet, uh, and um, in front of you, I, I tried to organize and I called all my old suspects from Central B, Jim Baker, Jim Ristler, all the bunch. And we had, you know, kind of ad hoc meeting to talk about it. Therefore, the first thing I would like you to consider, philosophically, generally, the importance of trying to find a way to federate our efforts. Now, what kind of form this can take? Which is not, you know, it's not a given. Uh, certainly, I, when the, Lisa approached me the first time, when I talked to her, it occurred to me that uh, her association uh, could be an umbrella because it's very neutral, it's general. Uh, the headquarters in, is in Paris. Um, it does not really. Uh, call on one part or another is a possibility. Whatever it takes, if we can find a way to at least uh, be, be a clearing house 
to know what the children were going to be doing. Number two is to generate ideas. And number three, to put these ideas into a concrete form. Otherwise, we are wasting our time. We have done that before. Now, I you know the example with Jennifer was reading about the Jardin Potager is an extremely good simple. It's a simple thing. You know, local farmers from Berry de Rocher, you know, raise some crops, do stuff which were done successfully in the 18th century, fed the city of New Orleans, and invite the people of Berry de Rocher to actually buy directly, maybe it's in addition to all the vendors we, we know at the reenactment of the Cour de Chartres, we can have people selling local products, or uh, maybe uh, all those sorts of things. This is a concrete thing. So the next thing is to have concrete development. And in all of that situation, if we can recreate or create or invent this idea of the French heritage corridor, we came up with this uh, the name to try to really cover that thing, the corridor, because which is very vague, but perhaps as far as the limits, it would, it would include part of Indiana, it could include part of Wisconsin, you know, the whole thing, there's a unique character to an area which was essentially the land bridge between New France Later, Canada and Louisiana. If you read my book, it's very clear. This was a communication. Only way from Quebec to Mobile, Alabama now, or Natchez or New Orleans, was the lakes, the rivers, all the way down. We used to call this going to town. It would take four weeks in those down through Mount Saint-Marc. But it was better trying to try to risk the British Navy going from you know, Quebec all the way down to Louisiana. So this area is unique because it represents in history um, the only way the French colonial empire could have a sort of a life. Certainly the governor of New France and the governor of Louisiana were two different entities, but somehow they had to meet and they met where? They met at Fort de Charles, they met at Paris de Rocher, and it on the central B, but essentially pay your shift for the shop. This is where the meeting of north and south took the place. So this area, therefore, is full of history. And in order to maintain it alive, we need an economic component. Without an economic component, it will, it will stay alive, but it will not be the success it should be. And the success it should be because it would bring, as a return to the people who live here, some advantages. <laughs> and I don't know if it's still the, the, the same situation, but when I came here first, I knew that I was told that essentially most of the people who made the Rocher would work in St. Louis and you know come back an hour later to come home and sleep here. Well, there are possibilities. For the people who created the Rocher to actually work here and develop something viable. Is this possible? I believe it is possible. Now, can we do something? I said we can do something. The fact you are here uh, means we have this possibility. Certainly, there are problems. And uh, the flood, you know, although we have been, you know, so far I've been okay, it's a danger. Make no mistake about it. Central View addressed the danger, but on this side, there's not really been addressed the danger. The danger we have to deal with it is very urgent. Uh, in my opinion, the levy is the biggest problem, and this should be. Uh, I, I don't understand the American system at this point why there's not a, a federal responsibility to ensure that the Mississippi, which has been reorganized by the Corps of Engineers, and as a result, became the raging fury can be, and we cannot be also the responsibility to protect the people. But it's a, in the part, an important part of the history, certainly by giving the status of important historical heritage, uh, would certainly help to fight 
to obtain that the lady be put to a, at, at a level which would protect, you know, not only Kennedy Roche, but for the Shaka. Agassir with uh, Sheriff Kiku from Chester, with the uh, Consul General Nodal, the Canadian ambassador, and we took a zodiac and we sent Mary. We, we uh, went around at the time of the church in Kaskaskia. Then we, we navigated across the lake and we ended up at Fort de Chartres. It was extraordinary. And Fort de Chartres cannot afford again this type of flood. Uh, it's amazing that uh, the fort is today in the condition it is. And it's quite uh, thanks to the people who are maintaining locally. But again, this which is another thing. Uh, the state of Illinois, let's be clear, does not take responsibility to protect this heritage as at least here. Piamina House needs maintenance, needs repair. Ask any lines from Kaskaskia. The fort needs maintenance. So in order to convince, not only from the cultural, again, I would say we have the support from the economic component. Now, the other part of what I believe is a need to work together because the Mississippi ain't the very wall. Okay. Sure, you know, we had a, um, when the French uh, turned over, you know, the family compact in the, to the Bourbons, the Louisiana part uh, it became you know, under Spanish control, more or less, in fact, what they mean French. So, and the, on that side, it became British. Nevertheless, to say that the families from Cascaster, saint Louis, uh, um, Pays du Rocher, acknowledged of their executors. They had this continuous exchange. So this is a, a whole. This area is a whole. And therefore, the need is to work together. I'm so glad we have people from the, the Missouri side and Illinois side. And you know, I hate to say Missouri and Illinois. For me, it's a whole. I always see this as a whole because, as a, as a region, it's a whole. It's artificially divided, perhaps on paper, administratively, certainly. The congressmen here, the senator there are different, but there's a whole. And if we can revive this whole, I mean, to a certain extent, not administratively, but if we can read to the French heritage corridor, which is a, the label um, I finally you know, decided to, to offer. Uh, and um, if we can revive the whole and present, uh, I would say, a common front because it seems like we are aggressive. You know, we're not aggressive. We're, we're making a case for something which is obvious. We have the land, we have people who live there. Lots of those people are concerned about maintaining this heritage, and we have uh, a need to support it with infrastructure. Now, what I would suggest that we discuss this, and we have that maybe we have to find a way to officialize the French heritage story. There. At this point, it's a trademark which has never been taken. You can individually, if you want, you can declare the trademark. Actually, Jeff Viviani, uh, 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 Jennifer, but you know, this should be done by an organization uh, which would maybe be a number. And if we agree on that, the second thing is to try to find a way to use to have a clearing house where all the news are exchanged. That's all I'm, I'm suggesting. I don't think. Uh, I'm going to tell you what to do here or there. No, exchange and try, then try to coordinate, to coordinate the work, not to reinvent the wheel, and try to help each other. So I put pressure, I'm twisted, my friend Erin from the Canal Corridor Association, my good friend Nicole, uh, Silvette Nicolini, my colleague, until, uh, at least until May 23rd, because I'm not running for election again. I did not think 2003, done it, finished. I'm not running again to represent the French expatriates. But she said, you know, the Canal the Corridor is, is actually 
you know, dug by uh, Irish workers in 1840. But there's a spiritual connection because this was the idea of Joliet and Lasalle, who were the first to see maybe we could link Michigan to Mississippi River. So I'm taking this example because this is why Erling is here. We should say we got that, but he has to do with France. The IMF Canal has nothing to do with France. Yes, it has. It has not an imperialistic idea, but that's in a cultural idea. So we have an example here. And of course, if we help each other, regardless, if we are part of the fight, you know, and, uh, and uh, um, Sylvette and uh, Lisa were cleaning the, the canal and uh, almost uh, drawn into it, which would have been uh, expensive for you guys, you know, insurance, you know. <laughs> but so, want to, to clean the canal, you know, that's an example. And again, so I would, I'm not going to continue on this because it's a rara speech to basically we need, we need to agree, if possible, we should have an entity of some kind, uh, call it a symbolical, call it French, call it heritage corridor. We are, should agree that we, in this entity within it, we'll all work together at least to change information and not to invent the wheel. And if we need to help each other, uh, you have an activity, we show up. You have an activity uh, at Cahokia, we show up. Is that important? We support each other. And the other thing we should agree on is to try to have concrete damages, small. You know, I'm thinking about uh, this idea of, of the Jardin Potager. Uh, and I want to look at Jennifer dressed up so beautifully. It reminds me of that two years ago, about we were in Austria. Uh, and I love Austria. And you know what the people do in Austria? Austrians, uh, I was in Pittsburgh, I was different location. They dressed up on Sunday, the men, Austrian garb, the women of the phenomenal dander, you know, I don't want to go into details, that was impressive. <laughs> in the dandy, they dress up on you know, Austrian. And I think this idea of maybe have a day of dressing up and the, and the French always just remarkable idea, small things. It doesn't have to be spectacular, but everything helps. So if we are, arrive to that point and we can be a clearing house with suggestions, with news, with concrete ideas, and we can share. And the success of one is the success of all. You know, the French three musketeers, the one musketeer, and for two, 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 one. One for all, all for one. And that's the key. Now, maybe I'm a dreamer, but I've been dreaming so long, why not? You know, I'm not going to stop now. And again, the fact you are here is a positive step. At least la, la flamme, the flame, is still going on and is still maintained. So, you know, if we establish this relationship from all sides and, you know, extend to the Ozarks, by the way, the people in Bonterre. Long ago, uh, I, I was for, for five years about president of the French Colonial Historical Society. It was my good friend, Carl Egberg, and probably some of you know Carl, great historian, and I organized the, a meeting in saint jean at the saint jean Hotel, at the old <clears throat> and, uh, and I was surprised when I had people from the Ozarks. I went to see them, and the reaction, oh, they don't want us. What do you mean they don't want us? Oh, they had the vision of saint jean was appetite, elite, that's just the ridiculous. <laughs> and nothing to do. Why? Well, we have the people from the mountain, you know, I mean, you know, the, the descendants of the miners that the Renault, you know, the Flamina Renault went, as you know, they went to get 200 miners from the other France. And I had a hard time convincing them. So sometimes they have an opinion which is based on zero, on perception which has absolutely no foundation. So 
I would hope we sort of silently, if not openly, pledging we are going to work together that Lisa and Jennifer Stavik is not going to die of a slow death of forgotten memory. We have to keep it going. We have maybe uh, think about the next rendezvous of some kind. It doesn't have to be here, it could be anywhere. And I uh, would finalize that we finally mention something extremely important. But I'm glad that the Angela Kava with the deputy French consul general is here. Uh, don't expect financial help you know, from, from the French government. I would be very surprised. <laughs> Nevertheless, he had some funds from time to time, like a staff fund and my good friend from Watano, you know, we, we have applied. But the connection is important. The connection will help you. I have no idea if you have a sister city in Paris in Roche, maybe you do. You should you should look at a sister city in France in a small town of some kind. That would be creating a sister city in Quebec. Because not only France is Quebec. Now I know Quebec is extremely well. And believe me, Quebec and Canada is very different. And you know, I'm one of the people who applauded the goal saying, Vive le Québec I believe in that. I went long time ago, I did a, a special show for ABC. And that time in Montreal, you know the expression in the street, speak white. You know what I mean? In my speak English. Speak white. This tells you volume of 30 years ago, the mentality. This is a challenge. This is a challenge because <clears throat> so Quebec is very interested. We have a delegate, Martin Dion, we have a delegation of the Quebec government, uh, and they are interested, they will support in one way or another. Mainly, if you're looking for connection, and I think about sister city is a very important thing to try to explore. So all in all, uh, I'm going to try to conclude my rara remark with hope that we, before we separate today, we are, uh, with the help of design, maybe somebody if you have take minutes, not to take minutes here, I'm surprised. <laughs> okay, you know, maybe we can def definitely um, agree uh, on continue to be in contact on sharing information, on working together, on helping each other, as planning for a next concrete move, whatever it is, something simple, something like a history fair. I organized dozens of history fairs. You, know, you can talk to your school superintendent or school principal, your social studies teacher, get the kids involved, doing research, the kids would talk to the parents, the parents will be delighted to do it, please come talk to parents, yes. and get something something concrete. So um, uh, I would, of course, I will be available to all questions. As before I finish, a little commercial. I'm, my book has been at the fourth edition. I, you know, I'm glad that the publisher has still been in it. Whatever book you sell, 10 bucks go to their treasury and Money is important, you know, whatever you can raise. Most, we, we have to raise money, except for whatever it is. But anyway, again, thank you for your attention. Um, hopefully, we'll meet again and we'll do more and we'll get more people to join us. More people to join us. Thank you. Merci, Charles. Very inspiring. Before we do open it up for our roundtable discussions and note taking, um, we have one more speaker who would like to uh, address our, our group, uh, Chris Martin, and I'll invite him up. Like, thank you. Uh, you're speaking to everybody, so just stand in front of the uh, yeah. reader and be yeah, here. I'm here. Oh, and speak out because. Hi, how you doing? Very good. Yeah. All right. I just wanted to say a few words. Um, merci beaucoup. 
Doctor, thank you very much. And the reason for this is I wanted to clarify some things and uh, kind of tell you how we got where we are today. This, as you know, is the plan you saw. And this really started uh, as a result of the levy issues. And let me assure you that as J Professor Jonathan Remo told us, that every levy in America is in the same shape as this levy out here. It's a big infrastructure problem. We made sure that Senators Durbin and Crest would know about that. Um, Part of that plan was we evolved to this point. This is the report that we sent with Congressman Boss to Congress, and it makes a good case. It even has the points in here that the National Park requires you to be, to be a national, national park, too, to be a national park. It mirrors the timeline and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, you were talking about revenue. What? You're telling me to show it. Yeah. You want me to yell? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't do much of that anymore, but I'll sure talk that. We realized that we would need sources of income. And so we've taken steps to ensure, in fact, we're meeting with a possible source of income tomorrow. And the other one is that uh, I've been working with the Corps of Engineers to see if we could get river boats to tie up at the Jaria Costello Walking Dam. And uh, so we're working on these little problems. We understand economic development and the revenue part of it, and we are working on that. We're working with Jennifer and coming up with ideas for that. So I wanted to let you know that we appreciate you being here and everything you're doing to help us, and uh, we will uh, be glad to be in any coalition that we that we will create. So. That's it. We want Rick Meyer Y and House. I would create an our coalition. And I would recommend that you do the same thing. And we'll be happy to be part of that. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. And thanks again, Charles, for your remarks. Because that should really prime us for our discussion for this afternoon. Um, it's been uh, kind of uh, talked about because of tomorrow's plans, where uh, those of us staying over for tonight and visiting are going to take some time in the morning to get a tour of the Illinois side, Perry Rocher and Baltasar. And then the intention was to take the ferry over to St. Junpia. However, that is not possible tomorrow because the uh, individual who would be normally taking care of that has some family business. And uh, this is an infrastructure dilemma. Um, it's a great case in point. So things are kind of in place, and yet they're not working to uh, optimal capacity. And hearing from Charles, who is talking from uh, a professional lifetime of experience, concentrating on this area, he didn't flex his muscles enough. This guy is really, uh, he mentioned his book. And for those of you not familiar with it, uh, I highly recommend it as a literally a Bible for understanding not only this area, but the history of the French in North America. It's really vast in the area that it covers, talks about it, it uh, lays the groundwork for a true understanding. So when Charles talks about all of these needs and the strong desire to not just come together for one time and have some good intentions, but then let it fizzle out, He's been there, done that. We don't want to keep doing that. We want to come together and make this count. So we do have some notes to take. We do want to start brainstorming and uh, developing some key ideas about what can we take and run with. And maybe by the end of today's afternoon uh, discussions, maybe we can come up with a plan about what's the next step. Maybe the next step is we do this uh, once annually. Well, maybe we do this in a few months. Maybe we have some other plan. But 
we should have a plan before we leave. And um, to start off, you may notice on your agenda some, some roundtable discussion topics. The first one deals with infrastructure for the 21st century. Now, of course, the levee, the ferry, um, roads, kind of the obvious, those are incredibly important and we should discuss that. Um, but there's other things that come to mind as well, things that we may not see, but are just as vital in terms of our connections in the 21st century. Um, I know for myself, my experience here has been a little challenging when I'm trying to use cellular. If I'm trying to make a phone call, text, uh, sometimes even Wi-Fi, it's a little challenging. That's an infrastructure need. We were having a lovely discussion at lunch uh, about an electric car. There's nowhere to charge it up around here or across the river in St. Jen. That's an infrastructure need. It's a challenge and it could really make a difference to for tourism, businesses, if we had that to offer. That's a need. So these are things that we need to start thinking about. Um, and when we start thinking of the virtual world and how we stay connected that way, then certainly we start to think of not just paper maps, but virtual maps. We think of um, virtual guides and phone apps and interactive ways that we can bridge the problems of maybe a, a pandemic that won't just go away with, with one year's vaccine. We're probably going to be living with these challenges for a long time. They may ebb and flow, but we should probably anticipate that these will be with us. How can we do a workaround? How can we still enjoy tourism? Maybe an interactive phone app is the way to go. I have colleagues back in Chicago with French Heritage Society who have um, all kinds of really exciting ideas about um, in-person theatrical, uh, as well as an app on your phone. There's all kinds of ways to, to brainstorm and, and, and develop these things, but we need the infrastructure to make it possible. Um, even maps, depending on if it's a national park or not, Perhaps we'll have even better signage and better advertising through the national park system. It, these are all things to explore. So what I'd like to do for starters is talk about infrastructure and talk about these needs, these challenges, and maybe from all of our uh, people joining us today, virtually and in person, you can speak to your own experience. Charles mentioned Aaron. Uh, Maze from the Illinois and um, Michigan Canal Association. This is a, a fabulous reference point because this is part of the National Heritage uh, Corridor, the first of its kind. So this is really the gold standard, the model. Back in the 80s, it became the very first one in the U.S. And I'm sure Aaron can speak much better to, it, to this, but it's um, something that uh, they have apps. I just saw your wonderful uh, news bulletin that I received the other day um, in my email box about a neat talk that one of the rangers was giving about it was aimed for kids about an interactive app. So I'm sure that many of us, it could be that uh, Chauncey Reed with your, uh, oh yes, you, you're not off the hook, uh, with the uh, Kaskaskia Cahokia Trail with that kind of uh, planning apps. Everybody's working on these things, but I'm not sure that we're thinking in terms of connecting to one another. How can we, we you know, integrate these sorts of things so that it, 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 we're connected not just physically, but virtually. So um, those are things I would really love to, to you know, brainstorm together and, and talk about. And maybe we can start off with, with that and hear a little bit from Aaron if you're comfortable sharing uh, some things. 
the infrastructure, the apps, uh, whatever. I mean, we'll, we'll uh, you know, as the discussion goes, we can work any way we want. I guess uh, backtracking, backtracking the app story, we started with a system of signage um, decades ago, and it was a time to be a good place. <laughs> You move it towards the camera. The goal is you're on the camera's eye. Actually, okay, go ahead. I'll, I'll defer to you. Go ahead. Uh, so we started with the system of signage, and it was in need of being replaced. So we replaced the signage uh, within the last five years. And at that time, we included a QR code. In the corner of it, thinking, well, maybe we could add more content about people who are interested and want to do more with uh, the information, the history, what's to do nearby, that kind of a thing. Uh, at the time, though, everybody said, what's a QR code? After the pandemic, uh, everybody knows what a QR code is. It's in all the restaurants, it's all the front doors of stores and shops. And so now we are building out the back of those QR codes with information on history, uh, things to do near that sign, what's, what's the nearest town, where can I find a restaurant, a place to eat, maybe even a bathroom. And so we're, we're starting to build out that, that digital infrastructure on the back of these physical signs that line the trail that goes below, uh, beside the island canal up there. So that's uh, one thing we've kind of worked on with infrastructure. I believe the signs were funded by an Illinois grant to IDOT. Uh, so there might be some help there. Uh, other infrastructure angles? Um, having difficulty thinking about that. Well, I think about your bike program. Oh, the bike program. Okay. So we are a national heritage area, and we stretch from LaSalle to Chicago, which is about 90 miles. And the spine of our area, the part that makes it unique, is really the Illinois Michigan Canal. And running beside that is a trail most of the way from LaSalle all the way to Chicago. And so our big thing is how do we engage people with the area, with the history of all the different canal towns along the way. And one way we decided to do that was to introduce a bike share program. And really it's a bike rental program in a lot of ways. So we have a couple of different stations and we're talking about expanding them. But at each one of these stations, you can drop in at LaSalle or Ottawa or Morris or elsewhere. And at these spots, you can rent a bicycle. So if you're from out of town and you don't want to deal with the bike rack and loading all the bikes, you can just stop at one of these spots, grab a bicycle, run up the trail to the next town, visit some things in there, visit all the signs along the trail and learn some of the history and come back within an hour or two. And so that's really been a great program. Uh, it was sort of interrupted by the pandemic. So this will be our first full year of that. And we're very excited. Right. Yes? How does the structure of your organization range? Is it a nonprofit volunteer or is it uh, government funded? Or, or how do you all right, a little bit of all of this. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so we're a national heritage area. So we get some funding from the federal government through the Park Service. And we are. Right ran though through a nonprofit that's the coordinating entity for that national heritage area. And that in this case is the Canal Corridor Association. So it being a corridor, does that delegate you like official uh, employees from from a federal level for that corridor? No, uh, I think you're able to get some technical assistance from the National Park Service. Um, to a large degree we just designation and yeah. it's coming to yeah. the we coordinate with different partner sites whether they're ran by the state of Illinois, by uh, private sites, uh, a lot of cities and municipalities and townships and counties will come in and coordinate with us. Uh, we don't have too many national park uh, monuments or that within the quarter. We have Coleman National Monument and we coordinate some of them and, and some other nearby sites too. So who organizes all, all your inner work? Is that not the profit that's associated? That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. the profit. So that's kind of how we're structured, and it seems to work fairly well. I guess the question I would have is, as you're talking about broadband availability, the capability of accessing an app or a website from your mobile phone, uh -huh. that type of thing, 
I realize that HTC is one of our providers in this particular area. I mean, if you pull out your phone right now and try to get service, I don't think you're having a whole lot of success at this particular point. So my question would be, in order to do some of the things you're talking about, it seems like we need to put the cart before the horse and or the horse before the cart and to actually do some goal setting and some thinking about how we can put what needs to be put here in order to get broadband coverage, whether we need to build, you know, the capability of towers down here by the fort or here by Ferry the Rocher so we all can have access to the internet. What are we talking about here? Are we talking about half a million dollars? Are we, what are we talking about for tower? Uh, does HTC have the capability to service those towers down here? I think they probably could. I don't know if they have the money to build the towers or would they build that for the number of people that are in this particular area? But if it's key to doing this, it seems to be that needs to be a goal on our behalf in order to get this done and have the right people at the table in order to tell us what needs to be done. We see at the federal level right now, they're talking infrastructure bill, all right? Wouldn't it be cool if we could get a small piece of that to put the appropriate powers down here to make, yes, yes, they're talking about Mark that. May, president of Prairie Yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually a cybersecurity manager for at and and I can tell you for the last 20 years, I've been trying to get AT&T to put a tower down around here for extra signal strength. <clears throat> and it's gotten shot down every time because we're not a density populated area. There's not enough revenue for them to get their money back for building the tower. So those are out. <clears throat> HTC, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but they no longer uh, deal with wireless the wireless infrastructure per se, they do provide DSL, and at the end of that, they provide like a wireless router. And uh, Tanya and I were actually talking about that this morning because one of the questions I posed to HTC was, do they offer like any packages that would provide repeaters or any kind of boosters that we could put in place to extend the Wi-Fi signal for a Wi-Fi router and how far can we get that because you know the other thing that we're looking at potentially is surveillance cameras stuff like that for protection and those want to run on wireless networks as well because the cellular signals are questionable so you almost have to use the wireless technology but I mean, ideally, and you know, I'm not, I'm not striking this out, but if we got some leverage from a state or federal level where somehow any, and I'm not saying at and I'm saying any wireless carrier could be subsidized in any way to put up some powers, that would greatly help. I'm going to touch base on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, Harrisonville Telephone Company, I would have been great if Craig would have still been able to be here because he's the vice president of operations. Um, but here's the telephone company daily. We are changing all the um, copper lines to fiber lines and running new um, technology and getting everybody up to the current um, need, speeds, and things like that. Once you hit, unfortunately, once you hit her the Rocher, there's so much of a stance of there's no customers between point A and point B. Um, so it's hard to focus the majority of your time. Not that not that we're not upgrading down here, but it's hard to focus all your time on the spot that has the minimal amount of customers. So Tanya, if you both hit on something, what happens with projection? What happens if right now it's true, the population is diminishing? 
partly due to FEMA and differences that have happened on this in this area. What happens with projections about a rise in tourism, a rise in uh, essentially businesses and, and population, permanent population, if something happens like a national park or you know various things fall into place? And it's one of those things where everybody needs a break. And sometimes you have all these things that as soon as that one domino goes, you know, everything goes, but nobody wants to push that one domino. So this is one of those things where how does um, how do companies look at these certain projections? Would they, you know, want to take a chance or would certain things have to be in line before that would go into motion or even be considered? Where's the threshold? Because you know, this is obviously something that's just a dollars and cents thing, but some of it has to be you know a little forward thinking to see business opportunities and get on it before someone else does. And yeah, we have well, my question would be to these providers: uh, What would it take? I mean, I'm sitting here ideating with you, but if I could give you a half a million dollars out of my pocket. Would you build a cell phone tower? Would that be enough money to convince you to do it? Mm -hmm. um, or is it the promise of future revenue that you're hanging your hat on? Um, you know, in the old days, you could build something with the idea that if you build it, people come kind of thing. But people got away from that, whether it was the bridge to nowhere or whether it was roads that didn't really happen in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But but tell us what it is yeah. if we could build a cell phone tower by fort de Chart and one here in the middle of prairie de rocher all right those two powers what would it take mm -hmm. what would at t require from us and we could write the check and say let's build it you know what would it take well along those same lines uh charles and i just learned uh yesterday that one of the lead persons for the Viking cruise lines, and I'll be staying at the hotel all of them tonight. And uh, when you were signing those contracts, Jennifer, it might be in connection with this. They're going to put another ship uh, online, and it's going to be on the Mississippi, and it's going to happen. And they will put them, I think, and they're going to have tourists coming through on these uh, ships. And it's just going to Anyway, um, this is going to happen. It's happening right now. Yeah, and actually, that brings up the point that this same problem exists on the other side of the river, St. Genevieve, down in the historic area, has terrible cell phone reception. And I, uh, you know, we joke about that. Uh, you can always tell a tourist because they, you know, <laughs> but. Uh, that, that's still an issue we're struggling with, and, and even given the park number, you know. And you know, Mark, Mark hit, on, hit on one thing is the initial buildup costs. You know, that, that's the one thing, but the return on your investment is a big, a big item. You know, you want to be able to know that. One, you can get the money back that you invest in, plus you want to generate revenue thereafter. Mm -hmm. So those are key factors. The other thing is I think every provider has mobile units, cows, whatever you want to call them, that they can move into place for big social events. So, you know, the potential exists that if you did have a big event like the Rendezvous and you knew that a lot of people were going to be in the area, you could potentially leverage a carrier to bring in a mobile unit to extend the signal for a certain period of time. They may do that. I don't know what cost is associated with that. I don't, you know, I don't know. But, you know, just food for thought. Mark, if we did, if I could, if we did the investment, anything that you would get would be above and would be a return. For instance, let's say Randolph County wrote you a check for half a million dollars to build a cell phone tower. You have no investment. It came to you from us. Right. All right. So anything that you make off of that cell phone tower would be money that you didn't have to invest for, is what I'm saying. Now, when we think about who uses cell phones, your school district 
could use a good, robust cell phone tower here. You know, people have DSL lines at their homes, you know, and that type of thing. But we all know what happened in education this year with COVID. Kids were trying to learn online. All right. So my point is, if we could brainstorm with our local company and we could say, what will it take to build a tower and to provide that for if it's three quarters of a million, if it's a quarter of a million, what it is, you know, if they could tell us if we could do that, that would be key for us to do good things in the future for Prairie Rocher in this historic area. But to say, well, they're not going to build it because there's not a return on their investment. We're not asking for them to invest a dime. What we're saying is let's fund it. Let's build the towers and let them serve it. Can I just, um, this is Colby Bartlett. I just wanted to make a couple comments if I could, uh, because I've been involved in some of the things that we're talking about a lot. Um, uh, so the, the organization, one of the organizations I'm connected with uh, runs the Feast of the Hunter's Moon. And I'm not sure if some of you might be aware of it, but it's probably the oldest, one of the oldest and largest uh, French living history events in the United States. Uh, started in 1967, and uh, we currently get around 40,000 people per year. It's in a rural area, and we we do have a, a do get one of those temporary mobile uh, units brought in for that event every year. Um, but there's there's several different levels. Um, uh, just a couple comments. Everybody seems to be focused on building cell towers, and that's good for general connectivity, but don't forget that you can set up a local area network at specific sites that visitors can then use uh, that network on their cell phone for digital interpretation. Um, so there, there are stopgap measures that can be used effectively that might not require as much money um, or as much planning and infrastructure. Based on that, there's a little telephone company. We do not deal in wireless cellular phones. Our everything that we do is your landline phone, your DSL. Um, we actually have television service, our own television service that we sell also. With that, we do provide free Wi-Fi access, like we have a little small community park. We provide free Wi-Fi access. So like any of the children, unfortunately in the winter, it's not as feasible, but we do provide it if they need to go and hook up a laptop or something to do online learning, you know, they could go to the park and utilize that service. Um, we do offer that in all of the seven exchanges that we, that we um, provide service to. And here's a little telephone company. Their first, as Craig had mentioned to you earlier, the first dial tone that we put up in our area was in 1898. So we have been in business for over, this is our 125th year that we have been a local provider to our area. And we are, the, we were, and I'm not sure if we still are, but the fifth largest sea life in the state of Illinois. Well, we did you have something else to add? I would also mention that we're living in a highly dynamic environment right now. And I think some of the legislative representatives that are uh, on present or on online can attest to this is there's an awful lot of initiatives at both the federal and state levels right now for development of connectivity to rural areas. Um, so this is a, this is a changing environment. And as we make plans for things that are, five, six, seven, ten years out, a lot of this stuff is going to catch up. He is right about that. There is legislation coming down the pipe. Legislation is coming down the pipe for that? Or yes, it is. Right. But you got to realize that when you're building out local area networks, that requires a server, a switch, a router, a lot more, a lot more administrative overhead than dropping a 
DSL line and connecting a wireless a wireless router to that. And then you know the other thing is there's still administrative overhead because and, and I don't want to get into all the dynamics of it, but I'm like totally against what they call what people call uh, some people call it free Wi-Fi, some call it just an unsecure Wi-Fi where the password is required. Totally against it, just because of you know false base stations out there and false Wi-Fi hotspots and open open for attacks so to me it would be nicer if we could get i mean does the port already have like a dsl line so they have one last year private company i have been on by the last company put up like a smaller tower and some kind of repeater don't get me wrong i know nothing about what these terms are called but it helps immensely and you can you can get some service there not as much as you would like but there is sometimes better than it was it doesn't require a password to access no, it. it's just you, you have better service there okay. there's some kind of amplifier for and, it and i'm telling you now that you guys really want to put a password on that i know this isn't the venue for that yeah. but uh but i mean, I mean in, in the work yeah. that i'm in we're seeing a lot more attacks Sure. Especially with any type of government related agencies right now. So, this would be state of Illinois. Yeah. So, and yeah, so the reason that, that came about was actually because of a, a safety issue because we didn't have any kind of access to a 911 um, um, in case emergencies for our event. And when we started stomping our feet about that, they started saying, okay, well, let's make sure that people's cell phones work in case we don't have emergencies. And so that's kind of where that stems from. And that could potentially be a very good talking point, 911 compliance. Yeah, I mean, because anywhere down here, your phone is supposed to dial. Yes. Yes. Lisa, could I could I make a few more other comments and observations and suggestions? Okay. Um, anyway, I. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Charles for inviting me, and I apologize that I wasn't able to be there in person. Um, as Charles mentioned, uh, and in our site in particular, Weatnon uh, was the was the first fortified settlement that the French established in what later became Indiana, and we sit on the Wabash, uh, on the Upper Wabash, and the one of the big reasons that it was there um, was because the Wabash provided the initial route of connectivity between New France, Canada, and Louisiana. Um, you take, there's a short portage as you're coming uh, southwest, southwest from Montreal and Quebec, uh, get into the Wabash, the Wabash takes you to the Ohio, the Ohio takes you to the Mississippi, and the Mississippi takes you all the way down. So um, it was, a, it's, it's Historically interesting, it's fascinating from an archeological and anthropological aspect because it was the true French frontier. These, the folks that, that settled there, that lived there, that traded there were as far removed from their culture and their homes as possible. And so there's a lot of really interesting anthropological and archeological questions related to the process of acculturation, both between uh, the, the native people and the French and the French and the native people. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, I think what the reoccurring theme that I keep hearing is a desire for something that can be summed up in one word, which is synergy. We, we want to create synergy between all of these stakeholders, all of these sites, all of the people that are interested in um, in, in preserving and 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 sharing and increasing the knowledge to to our citizens in the country of, of the French heritage of, of the United States and North America, um, and I think what Charles and others have already identified is there needs to be some type of a gatekeeper and an, an umbrella, and to me it seems like the French Heritage Society is the perfect choice. It's politically neutral, geographically neutral. And if we're going to expand, you know, most of the synergy that is in the room and on this conference call right now is Illinois based. And if this is, you know, going to become something bigger, um, you know, including Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, Missouri, 
uh, you know, et cetera. There, there needs to be an organization. And I think one of the first steps would be to um, identify all of the various stakeholders um, in the different states and have them listed, have a paragraph or two that explains the history of those places, their interest and what they're doing. And um, I, 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 for one, with the Outdown Preserve would be very interested in, in participating in that. Um, but I think that's the first step towards bringing synergy is to identify all of the stakeholders and bring us together under one umbrella to be able to share information. And I think the idea of at least an annual conference is fantastic. Um, and I guess I just, uh, we were talking about digital interpretation. That's something that I've been working with for a couple of years now on looking at the development and the national and international trends in that digital interpretation is going to be a huge part of the future of historic preservation and historic interpretation of sites. Uh, it, it's cheaper. Uh, in as we learn more about things, it's easily uh, can be adapted and improved. It uh, doesn't require the, the kind of initial construction and maintenance costs that a lot of recreations of historic sites require. Um, it's very sustainable and it's appealing to the next generation. One of, part of the problems in, in history and historic preservations is uh, the, the folks that we're wanting to talk to and engage with are often a generation or, or two removed from the folks that are the most heavily involved in history and historic preservation. We tend to be a little older. We need to start designing a platform to engage the future generations. And to do that, we're going to need to engage them in the, in the technology and the levels that they are interested or comfortable in engaging in. So, um, you know, I think, I think we just need to keep in mind that digital interpretation is gonna be a huge aspect of this. And I would love to see a, an app or a website or something developed that once we identify all of these stakeholders, that then we can we can push out to the public and say, look, if, if you're interested in the French history of the Midwest, here's a resource that shows you all of the places where you can go to learn about that, experience it, and see it uh, throughout the entire Midwest. So Colby, you're officially in the club. And <laughs> We're coming to you next, and you absolutely get it. You completely get what uh, this whole conference is about, what French Heritage Society is trying to, uh, you know, form officially. And you also helped me segue perfectly into a wonderful case study that I think we can kind of build upon. Um, we have uh, John Strand, who is in California right now, so he's joining us virtually. He is connected to the Amaro House. He is kind of a pioneer, pioneer in this um, area, and he absolutely can speak to connecting to that, that younger generation and his particular experience. Um, John, if you're with us, uh, why don't you jump in now and tell us a little bit about uh, your experience developing an app and uh, your background and, and your wonderful story. Yeah, I'm happy to do that, Lisa. Can you hear me okay? Is uh, yeah, great. Oh, okay, okay. Because uh, sometimes my interconnect uh, connection isn't isn't so great at times, and and that's something that we've always uh, has been one of our biggest challenges. So uh, a brief uh, story is that I, in 2008, I discovered a family story through the Amaro House. I then went 2009, came back to St. Genevieve to understand more about the history and the story. And by 2000, late 2009, I realized, wow, this is just a powerful uh, personal story. And what better way to uh, bring it to life than, uh, than personalize and talk about a person, a human person that's in family that's been involved in history. Because in my experience, I work with kids and my experience is uh, they do get bored very quickly with history until you start to engage them in the personal story. So then the next challenge was, you know, what am I gonna do with this? And then I went to the French, uh, I guess at the time, Creole Corridor Symposium uh, at, at uh, 
in St. Louis. And that was just magnificent. And that's when I went, you know, Kaskaski I saw for the first time and, and uh, Prairie de Rocher and, and St. Genevieve. And we did this whole tour. And I thought, wow, this is really going to happen. This is back in 2010. And so it's exciting. I mean, in one time, when, in one sense, it's kind of frustrating because, wow, that was 11 years ago. But this, the fact that everyone's still on this, and I think it, it continues to build, is, is this critical corridor that really explains French experience or French impact in, in the United States. And Because when I came, before I came this, I didn't even understand. It was all about New England. I, mean, I really didn't have any idea about the French corridor. So this was really exciting. This was all coming together. I thought, okay, I got to make, uh, I got to put together a website. And now I, I can only speak, speak from my own experience um, because I, I, I'm not a technology guru. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a historian. I'm, I'm kind of part of all these things. But I do knew, I do, I knew that there was a certain passion that I that was was driving me, and I said, I just got to do that. So. When I hear about cell towers and such like that, um, it's a huge issue. Uh, and yet I didn't really consider it a lot when I was doing the website. I kept on thinking technology is happening so quickly that this is just going to come, um, you know, just start to make the website, put things together, make it the highest quality you can, and then update it along the way. Um, and it took a lot of effort. But again, I want to, I've heard a lot of good things today about this, about collaboration and, and coming together and, and involving youth, um, I think, you know, one's passion all of a sudden draws other people. So we did the website and, uh, and then we connected with teachers on this. The next four years later, I had to take a break from that four years later, we did, we created an educational app. Um, and so the thinking behind that too was we needed to really understand what kids want. So uh, because of the technology is coming in so rapidly, I realized that people, you know, kids want to touch and move and, and squeeze. And, and even though that's something that we don't necessarily do, we said kids want to do this and they're very comfortable. So we thought, okay, we create an iPad app in the house. And that, again, took a lot of effort and collaboration and time. But what we were doing at the same time, we weren't doing just something for the house. Now this totally reached everywhere. So when I look on sites, sometimes I'm really reaching foreign countries with this site, you know, and, and, and so what, what, and I don't even know how they're interested, how they come about, but they, the, there's these searches that people do. And all of a sudden, you know, I realized that in my own small way, I was putting St. Genevieve on a map in a certain way that I had never expected. I just wanted to reach kids. And I believe that same thing can happen in Prairie de Rocher, where, where even if you don't have the communications right now and the cell towers and such, if you create apps, if you create websites and place them in the hands of people that can push that uh, information out, people will come to you. So they'll be studying about Prairie de Rocher and before it to charge and starting to get engaged in this history and they'll want to come to, to uh, Prairie de Rocher. So, that's what, what it seems is, is sort of taking place with uh, the technology. And, and ironically, today, I've been working months on trying to get this now, the app, not just an iPad, because it's not accessible to everyone, but to the actual phone on an Android and Apple phone. And uh, just today, um, I just got an email saying it's going to go live. So these things are happening um, and, uh, and not to feel discouraged about what kind of technology exists in the town, but to just uh, collaborate on projects that are meaningful to you and just do it, you know, just start to engage. So um, I hope that's helpful in some way. One other thing I think, Lisa, you mentioned is about how do you collaborate and do this? I think it's easier on a, on a, on a website because you can start to give uh, other people's links and other you know, materials, research that you respect. And you can start to link to towns or welcome centers. Uh, with the app, it's a little more difficult, but the great thing about an app is you can download it, it can be on the phone, you can show up in Prairie de Rocher and it's there, it's on your phone. So you don't need any kind of service. So, and that can lead into uh, again, digital tourism and such. So I, I, you know, I highly agree with Colby saying 
this is where it's happening. And one last thing is that uh, it's changing so rapidly what kids are interested, what people are interested in. And I think that's something like I'm working on a new project and within three months, I'm already changing my, my uh, approach to this because the way we see media now, a lot of it is it goes to YouTube uh, versus on Netflix and such. So again, I, I'm no expert in this. It's just about, I threw myself in it and asked a lot of questions. So I'm always happy to talk to anyone if, if they want to hear more about that experience. I'll just throw it out there that um, if for folks that maybe aren't familiar with using a, an app for this type of an application, uh, a really good example out there, you can download it for free, I believe. Um, there may be a small charge, but is the Gettysburg Battlefield app. Um, and it's a wonderful example of the power of that. Not only does it replace a lot of the uh, the traditional interpretive material, but uh, as mentioned before, it also um, is a tool for, for regional tourism because it, it gives you all that information of ho local hotels, restaurants, all those kinds of things. And some of the National Parks Service now are, are starting to very quickly transition to a digital platform to replace the traditional paper uh, if you remember years ago when we went to a national park, what was the first thing they handed you? A visitor's guide. Well, those things cost millions of dollars to print and produce. So the, the digital app is, is replacing those sorts of things. But for anybody that wants to explore how those work and what that looks like, the Gettysburg one is an excellent one to look at. Thank you very much. First of all, Don, that was I mean, inspiring and really, really helpful uh, pointers, tips. And uh, I think the Gettysburg app makes a lot of sense, especially with the Raise on Me plan for this part of Illinois country. That's a good reference. I know we have a question or something by question James. Asks to the, I understand the problem with local access for most people, but also as part of your development in the tourism, and tourists coming here, I have to confess, I want to teach my family, I can't. Mm -hmm. And people are going to come here and look at all these apps, but they can't get it that side. That's something I think the world has to do. So that's a really good point for those of you who couldn't hear. Uh, Jane made a very good point that you know, even if you have this app downloaded and you can interact with it on site, on premises, which is fantastic, and that does kind of get around a certain hurdle, the problem is, is that you're still cut off, so to speak, from the rest of the world, and that can't be shared, and this is the whole point. We're trying to share. I just want to make a point. Yes. Um, due to a prior commitment, my grandson's 16th birthday party. Oh. Um, we're going to have to go. But I wanted to tell you first, it's not really John to this job. But if you call me John, I Lee, thought it was John too, and somebody told me Chauncey, and I got that's very confused. That's oh my gosh. gosh. Okay. Um, one story, believe me, Lisa told me the other night that I told this story. So here's a story from mm -hmm. Holy Family in Cahokia. Mm -hmm. And by 1902, we, uh, we had a group visit our ferry from the Chicago. Historically, to the highway, they had heard that our carriage had agreed to let the Cahokia Courthouse be transferred across the river to the 1904 World Fair. The Historical Society at the time felt that we were nothing but a bunch of gay movies and we were going to give every you know, historical item away. So they sent a group down here to explain the way things were supposed to go. Can I just ask one quick question? Sure. What year was this? Uh, by 1902. So there's no, you're not bad. Oh, come on. When no, 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 I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't. When was the Historical Society coming to see you? 1902. Historical Society. Oh, you mean the Chicago Historical Society? Yes, because yes. I actually worked at the Chicago Historical oh, really? Society when it was the Chicago Historical Society. And I was hoping it wasn't one oh, of no, us no, 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 who was no, trying no. to. Okay. Good to know. 
Okay. The plan is for the fair, no floor, and so yeah, there's different okay. things there. So anyway, the people of Chicago think we're nothing but about the food. So now they come and they're gonna take back everything they can get a hold of in order to preserve it because we don't know what to do with it. At the time we had a German pastor, Father Father Holbert, himself, and he used to say this is kind of insulting to the way they approach it. So in order to get rid of them. What they did is they gave father gave him a uh wrought iron crucifix and told him it was from the original 1699 church so back it goes to chicago it goes to the art museum about 80 years later i'm in the art museum and i see this and it says uh, mm -hmm. original cross from the top of the 1699 wall church in cahokia it's like can't imagine how that can be. Mm -hmm. Well, at the same time, about the same time, um, our parish is doing some research for planning for our tricentennial in 1999. Needless to say, we were able to decide certainly that the cross on top of our church is the cross that's always been on top of our church. And it turns out Father Overfeld gave them a grave marker. <laughs> <laughs> And we went back and displayed it for about 75 years in the street, which is one. Luckily, when I was able to visit um, after this information came out, I went and explained to the director up there, and so you won't see our cross in the art museum anymore. But think about this, when, and I want to say thank you for coming down here and arranging all this. It's been a wonderful idea. I hope there's many more of these meetings. Um, I agree with everyone that we work together as a whole lot. I mean, it works in the United States. I think it could work for the French historical society. Thank you. Take care. I don't have any more time. Happy birthday to your grandson. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. So that was that was a, a, a nice little aside, kind of fun, even a good story. Um, so back to our, our discussion, um, we've talked a little bit about, uh, oh, questions in the back. Do I see an arm? Hi. Yes. Um, I'm Helen Stallhorn, and I, um, I've been a realtor in this area for a very long time. Um, I wanted to first of all say that we are very lucky here that we have a CC zone code. And the reason why is because we have a problem down here. We have Oh, we have an actual person that comes down here and helps us with whatever it is. So um, it's something I don't get when I'm up in Belleville working you know, in my office or something. And I, you know, I'm real appreciative for that. One of the things that I'm hearing right now when it comes to the cell service, and that's what I've been dealing with when it comes to sort of the limited support that's coming to Ben Brother, is that they do not have connections. But the other, the other side of that coin is I've been trying to sell property here in this area for a very long time. And the property values have continued to drop because we can't get anybody to come here to be able to. I, I had someone that was going to buy the bed and breakfast. They didn't have the infrastructure to be able to work at home. So with that, that's going to, you know, property values is where it's at when it comes to our tax base. For not only the county but also for the state and so if we can in any way shape or form get that conversation now i do know that there are some infrastructure funds and grants out there that have come out of HUD, that come out of um that come and i know that the realtor association the national association of realtors is making a grant avenue too that could be looked at um, because they do try to help um you know uh, keep property values up. Mm -hmm. So that was just kind of my opinion. Not, you know, if we're going to have people and company coming, companies coming in here and we need shops opened up and we need other kinds of um, industry and businesses, we've got to be able to have, you know, the property values worth something when they do invest that they can sell them and, and um, not be underwater. More than one way. To bring this car into the room, um, I'm Glenn Kahn, I'm the very proud husband of Lisa. <laughs> um, 
and uh, kind of riding the coattails, but listening. And I just quickly looked because I was curious. It came up with lunch, and we we said, I had the conversation of electric cars and charging stations. To put in a level two charging station is somewhere around six thousand dollars. A level three is about fifty thousand dollars. And you know, when you think about it, yeah, there's not that many electric cars out there <coughs> right now. But the demographics is a very high, generally, I'm making generalizations, don't jump, jump on me, a very high, well-educated demographic that is interested in history, that's interested in, in exploring. You're you not going to get them if there's no electric charging stations around. Um, so investment-wise, at the moment, maybe, and, and that's assuming that it has to be paid for by a county or by a chamber of commerce or by whatever, because Tesla or Charge America or Volkswagen or GM may come and say, we'll do it. But it has to be something that's jump started. And it will bring people, if there's nowhere around, you know, people are going to come with their electric cars, but there's no charging station. But it will bring people if there is. So, that I think is something to really think about in terms of the infrastructure with a relatively small investment. And you know, will eventually certainly pay for itself and bring business. So, you know, that's just one of my little how much is uh, level three? Three, I was I, I just moved with, so this is from you know mm -hmm. around fifty thousand. And um but level two is a commercial grade too, so it's not just that's not a home charge, but that does provide something. So yeah. just a little bit of information on that. I'm not sure. You're the one that has the Tesla, right? Do you have the app for the charging station? Sure. Because supposedly if you invest in a charging station, then you can pull up the app and it'll tell you exactly where exactly are. all the there's as long as you have service. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there's multiple uh, apps for charging stations and routing trips. And you get on and people will come to it. Yeah. Yeah. Pri prioritization is an important aspect of this. There are a, a million different components that go into it, but just keep in mind, I, and I, I know it's going to change over the next decade, but you're, we're talking about a problem right now. There, less than 2% of the vehicles in the United States are electric. I mean, this is a relatively... Thanks, Colby. We've got a comment on the floor. Go okay. ahead, Jeff. Uh, mm -hmm. Andy and I are going to move after the meeting just a little bit. So I'm going to want to address a couple of things, but I'd like to uh, reiterate some of what Glenn is saying there, which is about competition mm -hmm. and the demographic that you are competing for. Yes, at present, uh, the folks who have electric cars aren't a larger part of the population, but they are part of the demographic that is keyed into heritage tourism. I think that is what I'm That's exactly what it is. And these are the people that we are competing for, not just against other destinations. Which there's going to be a lot more of those before long opening up fully, but also that we're competing for families. And just like the thing about schools, you know, how complicated it is for a teacher now to be able to go on a field trip and testing to the teaching to the test, all that, that competition that is cutting into what we can attract for school groups. The same thing is that families. Nowadays, in that demographic, their lives are so complicated and there are so many demands on their time, we have to compete against that. And the more we have a critical mass to be able to get their attention and make it clear to them it's worthwhile to come to this general area that this French heritage uh, region that includes this side of the river, that side of the river, up there, down there, mm -hmm. that getting a critical mass. Who's the market? I think that's yes. 
That's yeah, a really yeah. good good point. Somebody it needs to be uh, figured out a study done to figure out who is the optimal market and the interchangeability with reach out to education because to me those go yeah, hand we, in hand. But finding the right demographic and targeting that. There's already been studies done about that. And by who and where are they? To heritage tourism and. Okay. Um, here, here's the thing, and the, the main point I want to make, by the way, I'm Jeff Giordano, I'm the executive director of French Colonial America, which owns and operates the Center for French Colonial Life over in St. Genevieve, which includes whole new cows, which was mostly the old property that the uh, uh, National Society of Colonial Games of America and the state of Missouri used to own in their state as transferred to us. And that the thing I really want to emphasize is that on our side of the river, we really want to work with you all and reach out and make connections again because we have to. We're not competing against each other, we're competing against a lot of other situations and attractions. And together, we are stronger, like Charles was saying. You know, when one wins, we all win. We all tell different and complementary parts of the story. And coming out of the meeting that Charles put together in St. Jen last uh, last fall, we actually have started pulling together a list of potential sites to include in a, a larger thing, and we need to connect with other people about what to do with that and to finish it out and flesh it out. We have, I haven't had time to work on it for a while and keep apologizing to Charles on a regular basis. I'm very patient. And, um, uh, but there's a good start here. And it is just essential that we keep starting wherever we can. You know, it's like Carol's been over and talked with us about gardens, what the beds should like, look like, and looking at the pictures in Guillermo's encyclopedia, as, um, <laughs> you know, because you were struggling with the same issues we were struggling with with our Chardon fellowship. But like the, uh, the French Marines who Fort the Chard are now coming over and doing programming with us on a, on a regular basis. And I want to throw that out as a possibility that some place that would be an easy place for us to start collaborating would be getting our various living history groups together and doing joint programming at different sites on a different basis. And I, I'd really be happy to dress up and <laughs> some time with you guys. Um, let me know when you need a priest. Yeah. Um, I do a pretty good ex but um, uh, the, the thing I want again, because we are here, the lay people, us, uh, I want to make it clear that we're very open and committed to the idea of collaborating. Let's say we do all tell related parts, different parts of the same story. We don't, uh, some of it overlaps, but there people get a better understanding of the stories when they see everything. And not just a couple of things, but everything. And um, that, However, we can start making that happen, and the sooner the better. Well, you know, we just, I think a key part of it, as some people have said, is just meeting and communicating more on a regular basis is almost taking the next step and say, hey, how about you guys come to Fourth of July? And, um, you know, we are, back, yeah, the Marines are going to come for our Fourth of July in the military uh, with the time. And, and it's great because it wasn't that long ago that it was, you uh, know, we did work together. Mm -hmm. And it just takes talking to each other and finding out that we all start, share the same goal, the same interest. And as Charles said, 
we are much stronger together than we are in the game. All seven, yes, down here. So, yes, I'm, I'm Belinda Kabat, and I the new executive computer designer in Chicago. And I'm Belinda, would you mind standing up and I'm just maximizing your work, voice? Yeah. I'm just trying. You want to stand up here in the back? Yeah, take, take my spot. Go ahead. Thanks, Belinda. So, uh, I've been silent until now, and uh, because I want to, I have much to learn about. All of this, and I, I took notes. It's not minutes, but I took notes. <laughs> and uh, because I, I just arrived uh, in September in, in Chicago, so I, I'm very glad to be here. It's the first occasion for me to, to meet people in person <laughs> and to travel outside of, uh, of Chicago. And um, yeah, I must say I'm a bit ashamed because I, I didn't know much about the French history here. So uh, I've learned a lot. Um, and yeah, I, I must say, I, I think it's not only me, it's um, something we don't learn much about in, in French schools, and that's a pity. Uh, there are some movies, of course, but yeah, we don't learn a lot about uh, the French history here. And I have made the, the test before I left from here, I discussed that with some French friends. And they didn't know about paleobiology uh, at all. I mean, so I, I think that we also have work to do to to promote uh, the history here to our French people in Chicago, in the Midwest, and yeah, also also in France. Um, and yeah, that's why I'm so happy to to be here. And thank you for the for the invitation. Um, I must say. I, I don't know much about the history, but the general country know, knows a lot. It's very fond about the, the story. It sent me some, some yeah, pages of books, uh, some maps about the, the country, and uh, also the ambassador, the French ambassador in, in Washington, is very interested by the history here. And he would like to visit more the, the Midwest. So, yeah, just to say, he totally supports his, uh, his idea, and yeah. Especially, yeah, I'm very. I, I personally find this idea of uh, French corridor in the Midwest very, very interesting. Uh, so, the consulate in Chicago, we are competent for the, all the 13 states of the uh, Midwest. So, anything we could do to, to help with the initiative, yes, we, we would definitely. That's it's a very nice initiative. We discussed uh, during the launch about. Uh, yeah, sister city. Uh, that's something we can work about. Find a sister city in France for the relationship. But I'm sure there are more concrete things. Uh, do uh, yeah, just my personal view. I, I was thinking a lot while we this name, and I really think having a, a website on Facebook page for for this branding of the French corridor would, would be wonderful. I, yeah, I have pictures in my in my mind of uh, yeah small movies, uh, small pictures about the the history. I think that would be that would be great. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank
unfortunately, I don't think that um, our representative from Quebec is still with us. I think the Marks and Dion had. Uh, and I will talk to him. But we can I, certainly. I'm in contact with him regularly. Uh, we have been working with because of all the KKP area in the center of French Canadian population. So Jennifer has a comment. Go right ahead. Um, I think you know, as Mark mentioned earlier, <coughs> the part before the first, I think that's I think a lot of the uh, the problems that we have here locally. Excuse me, it's hard for everybody to hear if we have other conversations going on. Sorry. Go ahead, Jennifer. So um, we're a small community, mostly of volunteers. All of our organizations, uh, tourism development is all volunteers. So while we do see the need for the websites and the apps and the scan codes, we don't have that accessibility really to create those things other than through volunteers. And like Carol developed the one for Port de Chart, it takes us a long time to do that. We don't have um, city employees like most towns do to do that type of thing for us. There's nowhere for us to go to learn, to gain access. So we it takes anyone here 10 times longer to develop that because it's myself or it's Carol or it's somebody else that's trying to do 10 other things. Question, to who, who does the Prairie to Racer uh, website and uh, uh, Facebook for, well, there's, so the village. The village is not half mm -hmm. So because I'm thinking of the French Colonial, the Prairie de Rocher. Uh, Chris Martin. Chris Martin that, that was Randolph County Economic Development. Because that is, that is a nice one. Uh, but when we're talking about tourism, when we're talking about we would love to create this wonderful website that we talked about with our tourism groups. Mm -hmm. It's how we can show everything that's available in the area. It could link to Cap Cassidy, the Hopia Trail, we could have an interactive map. We fully understand that this is absolutely what we need. So this is our future. It's obtaining that, getting it so, done, and maintaining it. So here, here's a real need. We and have we the have answer is very simple. Okay. This is where we should come in as a group. Mm -hmm. You know, based on what we have or the existing, we have a website. You have a website, but somehow mm -hmm. Jennifer should have to reinvent the wheel. And she could use a vehicle existing so she could, you know, post everything they have on something existing without them reinventing it was more the thing. They would have to have somebody qualified, able, knowledgeable in technology, which I think, by the way, it's not me, which helps them they communicate the information and the information appears. And then we hope I get it. I should include it. Jeff, do uh, you need us yet? Yes, I'm afraid we have to go. Okay. Are we going to see tomorrow? Yes. Are you in town tomorrow? Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm I got you tomorrow. tomorrow. Don't go away tomorrow. I'm about to see you there. Sandy does have some comments she wants to share with you all tomorrow. Okay. We apologize and we have to take off here. Okay. You know you can swim at clubs too, right? We've heard rumors. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, and we've so, seen the results. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, this is exactly what we're talking about. Let's do something concrete. Now, people, so far, it's very nice, but we have not done anything concrete. Tonight is definitely making a decision who is organizing this, who is providing the umbrella, who is trying to communicate to everybody here, sending in there. But the phone told you at the report, you know, and that uh, Jennifer's request is what we have to address. It's something simple. Let's faith in the work. You know, you have great people like Jim Paul, who is a guru in the, in the communication. I mean, you know, we have things existing. So they could just tag along and transform it. And, you know, you have deals of what we have. We have the whole, let's put the map of the corridor. Simplify with the main thing. Let's start something. Let's start. Carol. Yeah, I'm going to say from a logistical standpoint that, and 
and I'm speaking just for Lesame that um, if you have the format by which we all we have to do is submit, then you know we know there are people hired to do these things. We understand that. The point is we can include that in our budget and pay our portion of it, as opposed to having to pay for a complete site. And like our site currently is being hosted by a passionate for the shark volunteer. Uh, so and uh but so we understand that there are costs we just need to know the costs mm -hmm. and keep them reasonable and we are happy to take our share point and share it with other organizations who are sure are similar well to that end that is something that that frontier niche society can potentially help with for instance uh the chicago chapter we have a we have social media presence we have instagram we have a website, and as you know, we like to post about you, and that's exactly your need is the same same problem. Is that I was thinking when you were saying that, you know, we have the platform, but we may have an issue with you know, can you generate the information, and we we post it, we get it out there, we help grow that. That's where I see yeah. FHS just can play a role with that, and especially if various organizations, oh, and it doesn't have to just be Prairie Roadster, it can be on the St. John side, and it, it, can need, can it can be an in Indiana nice Coastal General website. Right. We, have a, we, we would be have one, exactly, we would be one of several that would, that would get this out. And so part of this is to start developing relationships, say, hey, you have something to post? Yeah, you come to us and we are going to want to do that. We will want to disseminate this information, um, others as well. But this is the sort of thing where we were talking earlier on about um, identifying who are all the, the stakeholders. And this would be a, certainly an umbrella that FHS can offer that various stakeholders can say, hey, I have this really great thing that needs to go out. People need to know about on the heat. People need to know about this stuff. Absolutely. And if you're able to designate a small amount of budget so that you can do that, this is how it grows. And and I think I saw some other hands going up or comments. Yes, John John. When you were talking about the I know we were talking at lunch briefly about it, but the, the cost of that limited resources obviously to disseminate, but uh, I guess that something like that, even just an endorsement or something where you can put under one partners on it, promotional material or benefactors that you can put partnered with Absolutely. that lends credibility, that lends visibility into it. No, it's, it's not true. just a, and it's I not just even... a bunch of yogurts having fun and Absolutely. Play, it's actually a real legitimate I think of some of the, the French community that I have contact with that may hear about something from me and think, oh, it sounds good, but I don't know. And then it, it, the endorsement the the just gives it that exactly. French, and the French government is being there. So no, it's, it's an excellent point. So. Excellent. I think, I think Char Charles hit the nail on the head. Um, yeah. You know, this is a perfect example of how this facilitator can serve as an incubus. Certainly larger, more developed areas will have their own website. But for those that 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 don't yet or never will, the FSH, the, the corridor, you know, confederacy can provide a proxy service for them. Um I mean, that's just, yeah, that's exactly a great example of why something like this is needed. For sure. Yes, we need yeah. I'd love to try to something you were talking about. I think it's along the uh, title of the National Heritage Center, Corridor or Real or. Yeah, French Heritage Corridor. I'm trying to put terms in it, but it's already going down to Arkansas. I mean, it's just.
international where is our official Sorry, one more time. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'm stumbling over the title, but I thought it was an actual interior designation. The national, the national oh, were we talking when we spoke to, about the island canal as a national heritage corridor as opposed yeah, to a national and park? This would be a comparable, a, a thematic uh, corridor. Potentially, it could be. This yeah. could be a route we go for, but that would be really ambitious as well. We're trying um, right now to talk about doing it ourselves and then getting going and momentum so that perhaps. That could eventually be an outcome. Yeah. Well, um, and I think that what uh, Colby mentioned earlier about identifying our shareholders and what Mimi has just brought up, another piece of the puzzle is finding out along you know, this entire corridor. And we can shrink it to our immediate region, or we can grow it from what Dr. Balassi has uh, you know, talked about in his book, which goes from the Great Lakes and honestly north of that in Canada, but the Great Lakes all the way down to the Gulf yeah, and all of the tributaries that, that span off of the big rivers. So we're talking a lot of, of states that fall under the consulate uh, of the Midwest. But if we start to think about all of the different places along the way, that I mean, in some ways, we do overlap with the Iron Canal, or we go to Indiana and where you know where Colby's calling in from, or all kinds of other areas, Wisconsin, Michigan. Um, they're all on there, and if we even take our trip from Chicago to St. Louis or to here, there's a lot of points along the way. So we need to identify these yeah. and begin to get everybody in, and that is no tall order. So um, people like Mimi, you know, don't be careful. I'm going to grab you in here because you uh, have this wonderful experience of uh, what happened. Oh, well, that's okay. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. You. And Margaret also has amazing experience. Yes, your hands up. Go ahead. Um, in the lines of contact and sales, if and I can do something right now. We have. Tourism and uh, economic development, and we have a lot of this on there. That is it when you're late, don't get those on there. And then we in turn can put our votes on those. Uh, but if you get them to us today, I can get them on there. Okay, so that's an important thing is that we need to start exchanging our links and uh, uh we have a different uh, you know and like the South Castro public good trail covers three counties but it's a big big important three counties uh and it's on there and it's already there in full blown color and many many psychedelic so Emily what is your your link so we can write this down now with Randolph Cast Castro oh and Randolph County is the other one I <clears throat> uh, Lisa, could, could I have a moment? I, I'm going to have to get off here. It's an hour later than here in Indiana, and I, I've got some other obligations. Um, I I don't know if we're operating under Robert's rules of order or anything, but uh, to, what, to what Charles had mentioned, I think it might be important before the end of today for there to be um, a, a formal agreement or consensus and I, I would like to suggest before I have to leave here that that the parties that here are uh, agree or vote on the fact that we would like to see the, um, the, the the French Heritage Society take the role as as the umbrella organization for uh, developing this uh, French Heritage corridor. Um, and at least, you know, serve as the umbrella organization to connect everybody. And if they are willing to take on that role, which I kind of get the sense that they are, but uh, could we could we get some kind of a formal agreement on that before I have to leave? So, 
Second the second the motion. We had a second and a third. We no have discussion. No. <laughs> no. No. Anybody in favor? Yes. Yes. All right. Wonderful. Well, I, you know, I can think of just off the top of my head, I can think of probably 20, maybe 30 different stakeholders within the state of Indiana for this. Um, and I, I would be happy to uh, do what I can to, to, you know, coordinate and provide that information. I don't know if there's anybody. Is there anybody else here from the state of Indiana? No. I don't okay. I'm, I'm, I'm the lone wolf. Um, anyway, I, I'd be happy to uh, make introductions and help facilitate uh, coordinating for Indiana to be included in this effort. Um, I think it's very important. We we are extraordinarily proud of our of our French uh, history and heritage here, and um, would look forward to being involved in kind of this larger <clears throat> effort for awareness. Please get in touch with me, and we will move forward with this. And uh, just as French Heritage uh, came west, we're, we're going to be heading east your way before you know it. So okay. uh, this is what we've got to do. We've just got to start, you know, coming together, having these conversations. And um, I, I think that for me, uh, if we are acting as an umbrella, the very important thing that we need to do is not lose our momentum. Number two is we need to um, identify who our, our share our stakeholders are. As Colby said, he can think of over 20 in his state. We need to maybe state by state start to go through very with a fine-tooth comb and think of anything and everything <laughs> that falls under this purview and form this ginormous corridor and it will fill in itself and it will help um, far and wide as you can see somebody in indiana is happy to join forces and start sharing a vision and uh, some of your needs here in prairie de rocher are um, shared needs on the other side of the river. And these things are just going to, I think, build and build and build, as long as we're committed not to let it falter. We just can't, you know, we stay the course. We don't let the fact that the one person on the ferry isn't crossing the Mississippi, we'll drive around it. And you know what? That we need to help that, that ferry. How can we have one person on a ferry? That's a cool job. We've got to find people who want to do those sorts of things so that these sorts of things are done for the greater community. This is this is a great example of we need to also reach out to people, start having people realize there are opportunities out there. Um, I, I think also one of the one of the great advantages to this is that for the I don't know hundred maybe two hundred stakeholders that we end up having involved with this is we we're not all over here trying to solve these problems by ourselves we can we can share communication find out what works um you know solve problems collectively uh or provide information suggestions or models for for all of the other uh sites and, and communities involved um I, I think that's that's one of the will be one of the greatest assets along with the advantages that come with being able to, to, you know, we don't have a hundred different people trying to advertise their sites. Um, we, we have one central place that, that can, that can help provide that. Yeah. Very good point. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Well, yeah, this is Jim Paul from Burberry. I think we should go ahead with a motion to trade market that yeah, that's that's general uh, French heritage board. Should upset anybody? I, I would second that. Okay. Fantastic. Because that I think will help immensely. We need some so, cohesion. Yeah. We have a momentum. Don't let it drop. No. I've been there too many times and I've been disappointed many yeah. times. So I hope, you know, so, I, I, I'm sorry, Lisa, I have to go right now, but just the last thing, if, if anybody, if anybody finds themselves uh, near Tippecanoe County, Purdue University, 
um, please get a hold of me. At least I sent you an email suggesting we create a contact list for all the participants and uh, included mine. So if anybody uh, is over in the area, get a hold of me and I would love to show you uh, Fort Wiatnon and the Wiatnon Preserve. So thank you very much. And I, I look forward to, uh, to talking and meeting more you in person next time, hopefully. Likewise, thank you, Colby, and thank you, Charles, for putting us in, in all in touch. Very good. Thank you. All right. Bye -bye. Uh, Mark, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, some of my questions have already been answered because one of the things I was going to, I wanted to back up a little bit because when we were talking about, um, you know, Carter Osher having a lot of information to share. I was going to ask because you had mentioned something about already having a site and I didn't know if you could be like the hosting site where you would actually have links for the different places of interest along the corridor that people could just, you know, like if you pulled up a map, yeah, you just click on that and boom, their page opens up and you've got all that information. Right. So so one of the things I'm wanting to explore now that we know that we're kind of on all on the same page is within our Chicago Frontier Bench Society page, what I would like to develop is literally some part of it that's just devoted 100% to a Frontier Bench corridor. Everything Frontier Bench corridor that, you know, will have regular posts and information and links uh, and, and so that, events along the river. Yeah. So that we can very much uh, have that presence always there, and not just like a random thing, like oh, Chicago uh, Frontier Wood Society is posting this thing about this big event. That it will be a designated part of what we're all about. It falls very well into our mission, and there's, uh, I think, a, a, a way that we can develop that so that we do have this presence, and uh, then we can start growing it and linking up and then everyone else uh, along the corridor will have some easy thing to kind of come to because we need a home base so to speak. Yeah. So you guys also have like a host master slash web admin that we would provide the info to and they would import that. No, I'm asking or are you envisioning us hosting our own site on our in our own hosting area and just providing you a link? Or what, it, seems, it, it seems to me in some ways it could be an either or and situation um, because, you know, as I said earlier, just because we're all a, a unique entity, that doesn't go away with joining an association, you know, like the EU, France stays France, Belgium stays Belgium, uh, you know, we won't talk about Brexit, but, you know, that those are still you know, unique countries, they're just part of an EU. And so what I want to offer is that you have uh, something going already. Yeah, continue that. And sometimes just a link to it, or if you have something like, like DNA or something really major, then maybe we would, you know, have more than just a link, you know, we would do some kind of feature thing because that would make sense. Uh, whereas there may be something else going on in Minnesota that makes sense at the time. But the idea would be this whole corridor would be, you know, represented. And um, so I think either could work. If somebody isn't able to develop that sort of thing and wants to defer to FHS as the means to get their information out, that could work too. And and I mean, for anybody out there that's thinking, you know, we don't have funding for that, you may have some upfront costs, but down the road, you can also include advertisers on your page as well that can help offset some of the administrative overhead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see uh, hands in the back. Again, like one of the experiences I've had in town, talking to people, meeting people in the day and a half of dinner, is everybody has a story about their family in Prairie Road. I mean, everybody has one. And, and then I just heard another story from, I forgot, it was Mark picked up the government, picked up it up. But that would be maybe an interesting thing to start a project on that's on a website. It's the, the, the real life stories um, and history that, yeah. we, that we can tell with, within the website, within the whatever you know, digital means we're, we're using. 
And that really, it really brings a, a fabric to it. It just brings a context to it. Um, and our prayer and road trip committee actually had to put together a 300 story list for the 300 anniversary. Oh, that's a great idea. And that was going to be my point. Maybe, maybe with us starting to celebrate the 300 year in 2022, maybe that would be something that could be shared on the site. You bet. You know, and really draw people to the rendezvous, the, you know, French trades, the different things that you guys do at the port. If unfortunately we don't get our goal of being, yeah, you know, the, park. the National Park Service, but still in the process of it, mm -hmm. you know, that would be maybe things to share and like people that, you know, don't reach us now, yeah, you know, reach. Great idea. Yeah, great point. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, I just want yeah, to so for anyone that comes to the platform that you're proposing to create of the French Heritage Society. Um, how that will we are. The, how will the person uh, try to do the interaction make sure that they're not getting too bogged down with everything in the history of the society, but just see right away what's the calendar of events going on if they are traveling that way or what? I don't know, maybe you can offer some kind of a uh, a template or a, a model for us to use. I mean, it's easy to get you our link, but um, a viewer, somebody who interacts with the website, is going to get lost. So where are the dates that are important? Right. Are we doing anything when I'm passing through? Why should I even want to do it? Right. I mean, this is kind of a full time job, really. It's a marketing, social, commercializing award. Yeah, that's know, right. We understand that us, we're all here to help easily pay for, you know, that kind of, and they would give us the latest and greatest ways to do that. Yeah, and Carol, you know, she's made this point a few times, and I think it's a really valid one that we should all consider. Uh, you know, it's a budgetary operating cost of the future, of the, of the now that this is something that really needs to be considered and budgeted for if possible. And then platforms can be in place to support that and amplify, it, which is again, what FHS can offer. And that really is, you know, kind of our mission. So I would say that would be a key ingredient. One last thing I wanna talk about briefly before we have to wrap it up, um, is that we had a motion that passed um, about trademarking this. Now, French Heritage Society, um, you know, it's a not-for-profit organization. I am not um, speaking on behalf of the legal counsel for FHS. I can't tell you 100% that FHS could trademark that, for example. So this may be the sort of thing that we have to explore what is the, the right way to have an entity uh, acting in this manner. It could be that FHS can't do it. I have to find out. This will be something that I will discuss uh, and, and inquire about. But uh, if for some reason FHS can't do that, then we'll have to come up with another idea about how we can. But I agree that that is a very smart idea, and that also kind of codifies this commitment and this this corridor idea. And um, I think that that that's another thing that we'll have to to, to find out. Um, obviously, we need to stay in touch. Um, I'm happy that we have people from other parts that have shown interest, and we'll just continue to grow it. I have no doubt that if we reach out to folks in Michigan and uh, elsewhere, that we're going to have the same result. This is something that's already off the ground. People are going to want to join it. It makes sense. Yeah, for instance, uh, when the government of the Kaiser team, whatever program is it developed, mm -hmm. you know, put together and advertise across all the people involved right. in this council in Indiana and calling them to a grand rendezvous, which is basically what it is. Right. The rendezvous, you know, in Pedro de Rocher around this event. And uh, then, you know, but then, of course, the part
all is going to be again where people are going to stay. Yeah. If I start, you know, Honey, get on it. You know, you know, this is always, you know, this is, uh, I don't say too much too many hotels. No, this is this is a this is a big win. So but you know, so this really do, you know, we had a long time ago a spot with the Peoria fact that you know, yeah, they did a big work, you know, because as you know, Peoria. You know, so it was a major part of the French heritage. And in fact, I go, I contact them. You know, it used to be a, a great people, Bob Michael, who was a congressman, uh, and uh, Lahouf, like you know, uh, but depending who is in charge now, I will go after them. We but, have to, they're, they're yeah, part of this territory. You know, a, we have a great transcendental period. So, you know, the same thing that you should work on it, prepare it, regardless if they get the mm -hmm. national park or not. We've got to have that high school people park. And we get the maximum people from everywhere, and that really will put it on the map. Yeah. Absolutely. The way, before you go, you've got to buy some books so we can get 10 bucks to the society. So, you know, it's a very good gift for your girlfriend, your husband. Oh, I know you have a newspaper. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So no, no, Yeah. And what time do you expect to be there? 
Well, we've got to do the drive, so. We've got to get to about 45 minutes to go along. What do you think, about 12.30, you think we would get there? We can, yeah, we can put here at 11.45. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, next question. Yes. What you have in your program or visiting center will be much interesting. Things first, the boarding house, the valley house, the underworld. I cannot give you that uh, exact. That would be St. Den, and we're in good hands, Charles. Yeah, trust the process. You know, my motto trust, but verify. Right. Uh, I did uh, verify uh, it uh, as a certainty. One of the we're major, under control. One of the, well, I don't know, maybe the one of the major places is Baker to be go. Now, Baker to be go is owned by Frank Johnson. And if they should see Baker to be go house, which is a unique, not only unique, culturally unique, it was owned by a mixed blood. And you remember, when the time it was segregation was the maximum, in a, in a place like St. Jean-Vive, you have a white man who bought a, white, a black slave to free her and to marry her. And her descendants live at the Beckett Pico House. In fact, I knew the descendants. So it's a very interesting museum. So if I have some better information at the time, I will call Hank Johnson to make sure we can see you have a Norman Trust, which is really unique. Then you have your job cut out for you after well, today. Thank you very much. Tomorrow, but when we see I you. I know the person in charge of Central B that could talk about Jeff. Who is that? Jeff. Who? Jeff. Jeff he was just ask? here. Okay, okay. And then I talk to Jeff. Just okay. specific. I'm an old military guy. I want to know what's missing. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay, we've got a plan. Yes, I just wanted to say, I was late because I had fourth graders at Shore at Cascadia, and I left Cascadia too. I was up here in 45 minutes. You are phenomenal. Everything is fine. <laughs> that's, 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 of Cascadia. That's, that's the local <laughs> official. Round trip kind of or, or one way uh, timetable. That's good to know. Okay. Well, I see the sun shining out there. I think that we should all head out. Thank you again, everybody. And uh, until next time, thanks for your sleep work. <laughs>